Jazz hands, can you join me in jazz hands? Okay, there we go, there we go. <laughs> Welcome back to the Big Daddy Gun Studio. We're live. Hide the women and the children. Hank Strange and Tyler Key are in the building. That's right. Our special guest tonight is this handsome Texan right wow. here, a big hunk of Texas, Mr. You're Tyler Key. Kind. You're too kind. Uh, <laughs> What's up, man? Actually, I got a uh, I got a speeding ticket a couple weeks ago. I had to send in all the information, and I got a I got an email confirmation today from the county that the tickets in. And it just says the state of Texas versus Tyler Key, and I thought <laughs> that's the last thing that yeah. I that I want in life, um, buddy. It's great to see. You. I know we chatted a little bit before. Yep. We came on, but you're one of my favorite people to see. Awesome. I, I and I'm glad I got your permission to say I think you're the most popular black guy in the gun industry. I think. Okay. I mean, I think it's I think it's probably Colin Noir. He's a lot sexier than me, but. So popular, have, popular. I'll take that. I have thoughts. I just think you're, to me, the most popular guy in the gun industry, black guy in the gun industry. Okay. Maybe one of the top five most popular guys. Okay. Sweet. Yeah. Hey, I'm, you know, I'll take it. So I'm uh, pleased to be here. Yeah. I, the excitement is all on this end of the screen. Awesome. <laughs> Listen, I'm also, I, I always have a good time when I talk to you, man. I can't, I'm trying to remember when we last saw each other. Was it Shot Show? Uh, yeah. In January? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Because I think we spoke for like five minutes. No, two minutes, maybe. There, so SHOT Show is such an overwhelming experience for me because there's a lot of things. There's a lot of people. Mm -hmm. um, and also, there are a lot of people who are like vaguely internet famous. And I, Coley on is a great example. He and I don't know each other. We don't have like a personal relationship. But to see mm -hmm. him in real life is very unnerving. Um, yeah. <laughs> so it's always good when, when I see a friendly face that wants to be friendly to me and you yeah. are one of those friendly faces. So it was always good. It was good to see you and it's always good to see you. I will not be at SHOT Show this year. No. So, uh, no, uh, I have a child on the way. So my wife is due in September. Um, and I'm actually taking a significant chunk of leave from my day job, uh, or paternity leave. And then I'm taking a sabbatical. Um, and I'm actually going to be on a week-long hunting trip during my sabbatical. Oh, okay, so. you're, you're, it's, you're probably going to have more fun. <laughs> I'm not saying yeah, so I'm I, not against shot show, but it's not as much fun as everyone thinks hunting, it is. Yeah, my hunting trip is during uh, during shot show. So yeah. Um, now I just noticed that you subliminally, <laughs> you subliminally did one of these numbers in your eye. So if we were mm. like doing Freudian slip, no, you use this finger, Tyler. <laughs> No. Yeah. Yes, um, didn't know. <laughs> shot is shot is exhausting too. Uh -huh. um, and I'm sure you know this, but like for so the last two years, I think I counted. I wrote upwards of 50 articles wow. during the week. Um, for like 50 articles that covered shot, usually 30 to 35 during the right. actual week of. So stop making so much noise, woman. We're live. Okay, Lola just came in. Sorry about that. That's probably gonna thought, that's, that's gonna wind up on the iTunes thing. A lot of banging. Just blame that. Blame all the banging on Lola. It's not me. Uh, it'll be. I came out. I came out to my shop so there would be no noise. Oh, okay. Well, you know. That's how much I care and respect about you, Hank. Yeah, I, I appreciate that. I appreciate it. <laughs> so let's uh, let's start because you see, since Lola wasn't here in the beginning, we didn't do what we're supposed to do. Usually, she reminds me to find out from the guest, you know, who they are, what's their background, how they got into doing whatever they're doing. So, how about you hit us up with that first, Tyler? Sure, sure. So, my name is Tyler Key. I am the only writer at writtenbytylerkey.com, which I launched at the beginning of July. So, not a very old site. Uh, prior to that, um, I got my start writing about guns at The Truth About Guns. I started, I think, the first article for them posted in July of 2011, um, so long time ago now. And I started writing for them because I had uh, sold them internet hosting at my day job. So I work for a server hosting company, and I sold them internet hosting, and I liked their site, and I read it, and I had their contact info, and I would written some stuff in high school and said, hey, uh, why don't I write stuff for you? And they happily took it because I read it for free 
and they started sending me guns and started sending me gear and I started writing and that was kind of the uh, start of it. So I'm based out of Austin, Texas. Uh, I am now in the air conditioning because it's 105 degrees here in Austin, Texas. Wow. Um, which I'm sure you're familiar with. Yeah, we don't get to 105 too often in Florida. <laughs> It's, it's bad. This is a very hot time. In fact, 2011, when I started writing for T-Tag, is, uh, was the last time that it was like this hot. It's, yeah. uh, so I'm not, so. I'm not good with geography. It's, so I'm assuming like Austin is, is away from the coast, right? From the Texas coast. I don't know. So yeah. people are going to get mad, yeah. but uh, I'm, I'm not. We're, we're depending. So like the coast, I feel like I have a Texas flag somewhere here or a, a map of Texas, but uh, the coast goes like this, mm -hmm. and uh, Austin is kind of up here in the center. So, like, if you go this way towards the coast, it could be like six hours, or you can go straight to the coast, and it's like two and a half, maybe three. Oh, okay. So, yeah. Yep. Yeah. So I, here in Florida, I don't think we hit 105 too often. We're usually in the 90s. Just the humidity makes you feel like you're on another planet. That's every what time sucks. I'm in, every time I'm in Florida, I feel like I'm just moist. You know, like I feel like yeah. I'm not. Soaking wet, but just baseline kind of wet yeah. um, the whole time that I'm there. So. Yeah, it's horrible. Now, I live in the northern, uh, north central part of Florida, I guess, in the Gainesville area. In the wintertime, it's really nice here. You actually, because most of Florida, everything just stays green all the time, which is kind of annoying. Um, it, it was like that when we lived in West Palm Beach, and it was like that. And you would see all the people that moved from New York, which I try to get away from when I moved to Florida, but everyone else moved there. And they would they would have uh, Christmas lights all wrapped around the palm trees. And it was just too green for me. So I like where I live now because you actually see the leaves changing. It doesn't snow or anything, but it gets a little cold. It goes, uh, it goes down to like what's freezing. Sometimes it's like 30 degrees or a little bit less, you know, oh. lower than that. You can like put a jacket on. Yeah. Yeah. I actually like break out some of my uh, leather coats sometimes. <laughs> and no one in Florida owns leather coats. They mostly have flip flops and shorts. <laughs> yeah. I was joking with a guy. I work with a guy from Minnesota and he was, uh, he was talking about how like, that was a couple months ago, that he was finally able to like unpack his motorcycle and like go outside again. Yeah. We're talking about how like in Texas, like our July and August is really the equivalent of like winter in Minnesota. Like you just go from air conditioned spot to air conditioned spot. Like don't hang out outside if you can, uh, you know, Oh, sorry. I keep going back to the question on the oh. comments thing. Oh, we've Someone got some says, questions coming in. Uh -huh. He's not far from demo ranch, Matt. That's true. Oh. Not. I've never okay. met him. Oh, you've he's never met him. Okay. Yeah, I've met him. Uh, like I've met, I think I've met him once or twice. Nice guy. That's a, ask that's him about Sixth Street in Austin, Texas. Hank, ask me about Sixth Street in Austin, oh. Texas. Gee, Tyler, um, I've heard of this place called Sixth Street <laughs> in Austin. Oh. How is that? Yeah. <laughs> uh, so historically speaking, um, Sixth Street used to be our industrial area, and it mm -hmm. got turned into a bunch of bars. Sixth Street is where you go when you're like 20 and you get a fake ID. And you can finally get drunk, uh, or you just turned 21 and it's legal for you to drink, and then you go down there and get fucked up. Uh, oh. So is it like uh, Louisiana? Are there beads and stuff? Are there boobies popping out? No, it's not like that. So there's like huh. so I-35 runs through Austin, and we have East Austin and West Austin, and like West Austin is like the affluent rich part, and East Austin is kind of the trash part, but like. East Austin near downtown has been kind of gentrified over the last couple of years. So like, that's where all the hipster bars are. Okay. But like West Austin is still like probably the most popular drink in, in West Austin is like fireball shots and natty light. Um, where like East Austin is like craft cocktails and like IPAs and people being okay. cool. So and 6th not street getting, is like, in West Austin. You're saying then. Is it? Well, so 6th Street runs across both. So we have oh. East 6th and we have West. Okay. Um, if you want to see, like, drunk white girls throwing up in the street, <laughs> that's very much a West 6th type thing. If you want to see, like, dudes with handlebar mustaches wearing, like, really tight pants and talking about, like, politics or something, you know, mm -hmm. and, like, being mm -hmm. intentionally ironic, that's more mm -hmm. of an East Side thing. See, I live up in the suburbs. Like I'm old, and I don't go out. 
Um, I go, there's a nice Mexican restaurant around the corner. They have frozen margaritas. I like to drink a couple of those and be in bed by nine o'clock. So I go down to the sixth street like once a year. Um, oh. but every time I go, I'm reminded that I'm not 21 years You're old. old. <laughs> so yeah. do you go from, so you go from like East to West, you go up and down or you just stay on one side? You, I usually just pick like when I make my annual pilgrimage to downtown Austin, um, I normally just go to the East side. I prefer, and I don't know how you feel, but in my advanced age, I prefer to have maybe two or three good drinks versus nine really terrible drinks. Oh, so you're good. Um, uh, cause I, I can't, I think one drink is all I need, <laughs> yeah. especially well, when know, I depending on what you're drinking. Uh -huh. I like to, I like to start drinking around five o'clock and then be done by nine. So okay. Uh, yeah, yeah, I don't, oh, you I don't, drink me. I'm not the drinker in the family. Lola is. So, well, yeah, I don't yeah. know if I'm much of a drinker. I'm, I do. Okay. Anyway, all that to say, uh, West Austin is trash. Yeah. And well, I'm, I'm a people watcher, man. I'm a people watcher. So, and, and I, you know, don't tell anyone this, but I like uh, white girls trashy. I know that's going to be horrible. It's going to sound bad. <laughs> I don't think they're interested in the people. Yeah, from a people like perspective. I don't ever want to talk to a drunk white girl. But, no, um, but there's so much fun, I will, you know. I will happily let them make a fool, you know? Uh-huh. Um so So now so yeah. tell me, here's the thing I wanna know. Like, um are there a lot of black people in Austin? <laughs> I guess that's the, the so, best way I could put it. Let's dive into the racial thing. Um, yeah, let's just Austin, get racist right now. Let's get deep. <laughs> and this is the dirty secret of Austin. Um, and this is, so I'm not like from Austin. I grew up in the sticks, like two and a half hours west of Austin. So I'm a kid from the country who finally came to the big city. Um, so I didn't grow up here. So this is just, you know, my experience. Um, Austin is one of the very last, heavily racially segregated cities oh, really? in Texas. So, mm -hmm. um, which is interesting because Austin is supposed to be like the liberal utopia. Um, it's like the one blue dot in the sea of red. Um, but if you look at I-35, it's like white people on the west side and black people and Mexicans on the uh, east side. So like, is that is that um, institutional segregation? It, or is it just that people are doing like people segregating themselves and black people like to live with the other black people or white people like to live over here or there's tensions so, that come up. So, um, I would say there's probably some element of like cultural, like, Hey, we want to be with our kind or whatever. Um, more pressing is that there's like a really bad, um, what is the name of it? When they redraw all the lines, um, um, redistricting. Yes, uh, gerrymandering. Okay. Um, it's a very bad gerrymandering problem. Um, and the, the east side is like where nobody really paid attention. So as an example, when I first moved to Austin in, 20, in 2009, um, the east side was like scary. Like, Don't go was, over there. <laughs> it was getting better. Like I, I, did, I wasn't here when it was truly bad, but like – it was still kind of a sketchy part of town. Um, the west side was always really nice. And if you go down to, like if, if you went down to 6th Street when I moved here in 2009, um, you'd have like cops everywhere. They cordoned off the streets. Hey, everybody come down, have a good time, party, party. If you went over to the east side, like you could get stabbed or shot. Um, <laughs> there's an intersection. There's an intersection on the east side called 12th and Chacon. And for the longest time, 12th and Chacon was the most dangerous intersection in austin that just sounds violent, bad man 12th and Chicago. yeah and uh my, so my wife uh is a nurse and she got her first job right out of nursing school working at the level one trauma facility at uh, what, what was uh brackenridge hospital it's actually just closed down um so brack's the level one trauma facility it's where all the gunshots and stabbings go and like <laughs> every night she had patients from 12th and Chicago. um and it's right where like uh, all of like the Mexican and black, uh, gangs, like that is the most uh. contested, um, corner. And I remember like a couple years after that, uh, we had a friend that bought a house at like eighth in Chacon or something like that. Or maybe it was like 
it was like 13th in Chacon. And I was <laughs> no, like, that's worse. <laughs> and I was like, holy shit, man, like you're going to die. And he was like, no, the neighborhood's super coming up. And he paid like absurd money for the house. So what's happened is like all of these minorities and poor minority, I mean, especially poor minorities have been moved out of the area. Um, either because so gentrification is going on. Yes. And it's terrible. Like, it's um we have a lot of people who we have a lot of transplants from california we have a lot of people from la um you can go buy you know a gritty home on the east side or whatever yeah um and it's like our little pocket of like well you're from new york brooklyn you know brooklyn's like hipster central now right but yeah. like when you were there and prior maybe like brooklyn was not the hipster paradise no, no. you know i mean i was in bed style man that was like do or die even when i lived there but it's totally different. Exactly. Now, all those brownstone they're they're expensive, first of all. Yeah. Um, you know, exactly. I, I think I was just telling you my younger brother bought a place in Brooklyn, a brownstone, for eight hundred thousand dollars. It's crazy. And I and I remember like I remember when those brownstones were going for like forty fifty in Brooklyn. So yeah. Um so uh Tyvin, the Tyvin show, he says, um it's the old railroad divides the city like back in the day highway 35 is the split line so there's kind of like a railroad right and it's like this side of the tracks and that side of the tracks yep. kind of um, thing yep exactly and so it's been it's been kind of hard to watch just because like well like you know like those areas are where like the good food is um like you're not going to get a good taco in like west austin where all the white people are like you have to go to the shitty part of town because like that's where the good tacos are, you know? So like, yeah, yeah. All of those places have been leveled and there's like high rises there now. Yeah. Um, that's how, that's how you, that like, that's usually where all the good food is in the hood, by the way. You and, notice that? Like, cause I used to, it's so, like KFC, it's like KFC or Popeye's or any of those things. If you want good chicken, don't go to like the Popeye's or the KFC that's in the nice white neighborhood. Cause the chicken will suck. No. It's terrible. <laughs> yeah. Um, but you go in the hood where they're afraid to like fuck up people's chicken because <laughs> you so, won't get shot where there's like bulletproof glass. That's the awesome yes, chicken. That's the place. It's cash only. Uh, yeah. So there's a, so, so I work, um, and if you have any Austin listeners, readers, I'll definitely, hopefully I'll get some street cred. So right. my day job office is at 35 in Runberg. Um, and that, intersection and like that general area is like the second most violent zip code in Austin. Okay. And like, See, I don't like the, the names, man. The names, Tyler, first of all, 12th and Chacon, anything in Chacon. I've watched too many movies of like LA. So if you tell me, Hey Hank, meet me at 12th and Chacon. I'm like, no dude, you know you're gonna say I'm that. not meeting exactly. you on anything in Chacon. And then what did you exactly. just call it? Runberg? No, Runberg. I'm not going Runberg. to any place named Runberg. <laughs> So, like, so 35 in Runberg is the second most violent zip code in Austin. And to count, like, violent in Austin is, like, the north side in Chicago. Yeah, like, it's not – it's, like, pretty vanilla, right? Like, we're not – there's, like, maybe eight murders a year in that zip code. It's not, like, eight murders a day in Chicago, on the south side of Chicago or whatever. But mm -hmm. by Austin standards, it's pretty bad. And uh, so my office is right there. And, uh, dude, the Mexican food there is so incredible. Like – Every like every strip mall has like sixty bomb ass taco shops. Like okay. you can get unbelievable tortillas, like super fresh. You can get like really good migas. If you're hungover, you can get menudo. Like all that stuff is right there. And like the East Side used to have that, and now it doesn't because so all the so where's like so where do there. people go to get the good weed or the drugs? I'm guessing it's the East Side. <laughs> Uh, so, so I think like if you were um, if, if so if you wanted to get high uh, and, and you wanted some ditch weed like that East Side is still probably the place. But if you want to get like really and I don't partake. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. Right. I was you fell into the trap, Tyler. Don't even try to don't try to play. No, it's fine. Like I'll pass a piss test. Um, mm -hmm. I uh, I have very weak lungs. Hank is the issue. I would I would, but I'm just I'm not fit for it. Um, okay. But the like Austin has so many smart people who are like really into like horticulture and stuff that you can get some like truly crazy scary weed here. Um, okay, I see. Right, right. Yeah, like not like the kind of fun like. Hey, we're this gonna is the death weed. 
Yeah, we're gonna like smoke a joint and hang out. Uh, who's Cat Williams has a great bit about like having to like smoking weed with people and like getting some like crazy medicinal shit yeah. to just like the serious uh, yeah. ganja, like death ganja death or something, something crazy like that. I don't I don't do any kind of drugs or anything like that. I don't uh, except for the the uh, legal prescription kind, which I hate. You know, but I still try to avoid taking that. I barely drink, and I don't have, uh, you know, I'm not like, even though I'm a big dude, and you think I'll be able to take that stuff, no, I would totally lose it. So, yeah, I don't. Um, between like, uh, so I was an athlete in college, so I was subject to NCAA screening, and I was like, it's not like I was on a scholarship, but being an athlete was important to me, so I never really wanted. I didn't. Like, there were a ton of ways that I was going to end up fucking up my athletic career. I wanted to remove one that was completely in my control. And then, like, I got a job, and, like, you kind of don't want to fuck that up either. Mm -hmm. um, and then, mm -hmm. like, I got into guns. And then I got into, like, silencers. And I started, you know, like, messing around with silencers and short barreled rifles and NFA stuff. And, like, that's the sort of thing that, like, you really don't want to have, like, drugs and short barreled rifles and silencers and machine guns. Yeah, right, absolutely. Uh, yeah. And I'm not against, I mean, I think those things, uh, I guess I'm, I don't like to call myself a libertarian, but I don't really think that, I think the, the war on drugs and all that's caused us a lot of problems in this country. I think we need to. One of, the, one of the biggest causes. Um, yeah. So we need to legalize all that. I just don't always, like, I don't side with the people who just want to legalize drugs, right? I mean, that's. Like those guys, they want to legalize drugs, but they don't want us to be able to protect ourselves, which doesn't make any sense to me. But yeah, well, kind of there was I think there was a, a Canadian politician who ran on the uh, ran on the platform of like I want a gay I want a gay married couple who owns a pot farm to or to be able to protect their pot farm with machine guns, like. Yeah. That pretty much sums up my freedom. You know, <laughs> freedom, you know, you can be who you want to be. You know? Yeah, I don't. I don't yeah. give a shit. Like as long as you pay your taxes, I'm. Yeah. And it's a reasonable tax rate. I'm. I'm probably yeah. cool with it. Um, yeah. So I. Austin's a. Austin's apparently a weed city. I don't. Uh, I don't partake. So if you wanted the hookup, if you came to Austin, it. We'll just put it out there for your viewers. If you come to Austin and we hang out, and you're like, hey man, I want to score some drugs. I'm not that guy. <laughs> like, yeah. Because I said score some drugs, you probably figured out that I'm not that guy. Yeah, there's so, probably. So, how are you guys doing on? Is that like um, legal in Texas for medicinal purposes? Probably not. I think it. I think it's. Um, I saw a thing the other day that under certain circumstances it can be a medical okay. thing. Um, Austin will not. This is just very interesting talking about like laws and stuff. Um, so we have Travis County, which is where Austin is, and just north of us is Williamson County. Um, Travis County, if you were going to smoke weed, that's the place. Like, they're probably just going to throw it out and, like, maybe write you a ticket. In Williamson County, you'll go to jail. Like, they'll hit you with a felony. Uh, mm. A couple years ago, there's, like, a big famous case about this. Kid was driving back to college. He had a sheet pan of uh, pot brownies. And they charged him at the weight of the brownies and the sheet pan. <laughs> wow. Okay. Yeah. But on the flip side, um, if you – uh, shoot somebody in self-defense in Travis County, like, you should probably lawyer up. It's definitely going to a jury. Like, you're going to go through the legal system. But in there's Williamson no, County... There's no stand your ground in Texas? There, There is stand your ground, but, like, uh, Travis County's not super pro-gun, so, like, oh. there's a very good chance you're going to go through the court system. Like, mm -hmm. we don't, you know, like, we're not throwing people in jail for using their guns, but, like, you're probably going to go to a grand jury. Mm -hmm. Um... No, no, no bill or whatever. But in Williamson County, like, short of you, like, just shooting somebody for shit, like, mm -hmm. it's probably going to go nowhere. Like, uh, the kind of common wisdom I've heard from cops in both cities is that, like, if you're going to smoke pot, Travis County is the place. And if you're going to shoot somebody, Williamson County is a better place for that. Um, okay. <laughs> Drag them across the border, kind of crazy. Pretty much. Well, and, then, like, I've definitely heard from people that like if you have drugs in the car and you're going through Williamson County on 35 and you see the lights, just run and try to make it to Travis County. <laughs> <laughs> That's like back in the day. That's like Dukes of Hazard or something like that, right? Yeah. Like, like they're really going to actually let you drive all the way over there. You probably get run over by an MRAP <laughs> and then shut yeah. up. 
with some M16s. Don't uh, try it. The uh, the 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 Williamson County uh, Police Department or the sheriffs or whatever they are huge on getting some of that uh, some of that grant money. So oh. uh, they will. Uh, they've got MRAPs. They've got all the cool shit. Like all their cops have like night vision. Like they are loaded They're up with ready. Cool equipment. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so I just so, just so folks know, we're going to talk about some new stuff and all of that. I, I just want to uh, we'll stop talking about drugs now. Yeah, well, no, we can still keep talking about drugs if you want to. <laughs> talking about racial segregation, drugs. Yeah. Really, all we have left are politics and sex. Yeah, sex. You know, we'll we'll get on that. Um, you know. <laughs> Yeah, so here's so here's the thing. I want uh, to encourage everyone. Tyler, if you're just joining us, he he has a blog. It's called Written by Tyler Key. So I want to encourage everyone to go check out that blog and your social media. What are you on Instagram and Facebook? Instagram and Facebook. I do a lot more on Instagram than I do on Facebook. Um, in fact, I don't know if you remember this, but you were the person that told me that I had to get Instagram. Oh, really? Yeah, you're like, well, you got to get on the gram. Yeah, that's probably back in the days. I guess I was selling a lot of people on Instagram in the beginning. <laughs> I got a personal Instagram because you told me to. Oh, um, sweet. Cool. But yeah, That's, I, that's uh, you and Mac from Military Arms Channel. The, is that true? Yeah, yeah. Mac, um, when I met him, he had like thousands of people that were following him on Instagram, and he wasn't putting any pictures up there. And he takes a lot of pictures. I was like, dude, you know. You need to put pictures up there for your fans. Now he puts up something and it gets like 20, 30,000 likes. He's like a monster. That's awesome. On Instagram. So, you know, I, I wish I was getting some residuals. Yeah. <laughs> but no. Yeah. Pay you a consulting fee. Delayed. Yeah. <laughs> no, he's a good guy, though. He helped me out a lot. So I'm glad I did something good for him. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, so I, I want to encourage everyone, written by Tyler Key, and just in case, you know, um, I, now Lola has written it on the board that I have to ask you, but you did talk about this uh, where you got your start writing in firearms, and basically that was T Tag, right? The Truth About Guns. Yeah, so I wrote exclusively for the Truth About Guns for six years. Yeah. Um, so you just yeah, jumped right into this as a writer. Yeah, pretty much, man. Um, so I wrote in high school. Um, I wrote for the school newspaper. Um, I'd written in college a little bit for. Um, the you know the the college newspaper like I wrote some editorials. Um, I always liked writing and uh, it was a good good outlet for me. And so I I'd said my wife you know her first job right out of college was uh, working at this level one trauma facility. She worked nights. Uh, I worked days. So we had this tiny little one bedroom apartment that we moved into and we couldn't both be there at the same time like because she needed to sleep and I'd be wide awake or like you know, she'd be at work and I'd have all this free time. And so I'd always been into guns um, and mostly hunting. And so I wrote um, I wrote a piece about hunting. It's out there somewhere. Um, it's the very first thing I ever published on the internet. Um, but I wrote a piece about hunting and um, submitted it and they liked it and they ran it and kind of just took off from there. Yeah, I see that you're also a very romantic writer. I was checking your about section of your blog. Oh. Yeah, and I see that you said the the biggest reward that you've gotten from writing was something that you wrote, and then a young lady responded to it, and now you guys are married and have babies. <laughs> yes, we have a baby on the way. So that's cool. I had um, I'd written like back when like I, I'm sure Facebook still has it, but um, Facebook had like the notes thing. You could like publish a note, and so like I would write. D like just dumb shit, you know, like nobody who's 20 years old has anything important to say, I think, maybe, whatever. Mm -hmm. um, especially not, it, especially if it's about their parents. <laughs> I'm just saying that that's just a personal experience. No, go ahead. Yeah, I just like, there's just not, there's nothing of substance there. Um, mm -hmm. So anyway, I wrote this thing about how like we were, uh, I was living off campus and we were uh, like, our house didn't have, heating like it's like an old house so it had like window units for air conditioning for the summer but during the winter it was really cold like there was no like single pane windows um you know it gets down into like the 30s in central texas and so mm -hmm. i had i had like written a kind of tongue-in-cheek thing about how um i was looking for a space heater 
Mm-hmm. Uh, oh, I see. To, in quotes. To come, Air quotes. To, space to come, heater. To come spend some time in my luxurious queen size bed off campus, uh, and let me use like their uh, their dining dollars. You know, it's like the campus because I didn't have any money for food, um, mm-hmm. and so I was like, hey, like if you're a cute girl, you can come stay at my place, and uh, you can have like a cool off campus guy and um you just let me eat your food uh that you're not gonna eat anyway and it was like real tongue and cheek or whatever and so uh my now wife but then was just the younger oh. sister of one of my friends uh commented on it was like hey this is super funny like you're a very funny guy my roommates and i are just cracking up about this and uh i had met her for the first time like a couple weeks before that and i thought she was super cute mm-hmm. and so uh she was dating a guy and I just like internet stalked her on Facebook until they broke up. And then when they broke up, I swooped right in. Just wore her down. I know I've been there. That's what I had to do with Lola. Wear her down. She looks, she looks back now. She's like, how did, how did you do this? Like what a crazy thing. Like if any of my friends today told me that like some guy had just like stalked him on the internet basically. And like started just blowing up their phone. I would be like, what a crazy person. Like get him out of your life. Like, how did I fall for it? And I was like, I don't know, but. Yeah, that's, married, that's how most baby. of us guys do, man. Lots of stalking. Also, she responded to a booty call letter, <laughs> basically. Yeah, exactly. So exactly. a booty call and food call letter. So, you know, hey, it works out sometimes, man. You got to be persistent. So thank you for saying I'm romantic. Um, thanks for checking out the website. Um, I is it, can I, can I pimp my own stuff? Absolutely. Hell yes. Pimp it. So. Um, I wrote for T-Tag for a long time because T-Tag is the truth about guns. Mm-hmm. Really all I ever wrote about was gun stuff. Um, and I had kind of a desire to write other things, but I never really had an outlet for it. And due to, you know, my departure from T-Tag, uh, I kind of suddenly had editorial freedom to write whatever I wanted. Um, mm-hmm. And so let's, I not, had, let's not skip over that. I mean, was everything good? I know we don't want to get too deep into it here. Yeah. When you left T-Tag, was it all good? You still have friends over there? I do. So um, leaving T-Tag was not my choice. Um, I, I was asked to leave by the owner of the site. Um, we had some creative differences, I guess. Um, I always thought that term was pretty cliche. Yeah. Um, when like artists talked about like why their band was breaking up. But um, we had some creative differences. Um, and it ultimately led to, you know, the owner basically telling me that like I didn't have a home at T Tag anymore, um, which uh, like really hurts. Like a lot. I mean, like that sucks. You know, like nobody likes to get fired. It was like your um, first home, so I can, I understand that. I mean, it's where you got your start. Yeah, yeah, and and um, more kind of like more to the point. Um, like when I started writing for T Tag. Nobody at T Tag lived even in Texas. Like it was just me and Austin. And mm-hmm. over the years, the owner, editor, uh, two of the staff writers. Um, they all eventually all, became gun guys and moved out to Texas, or they, they were, were in all, Texas they were the first they one. were already okay. gun guys, but they moved to Austin. Um, mm-hmm. And so, like, I kind of, in a way, like assembled this little crew in Austin. Um, yeah, I see Jeremy S. Who's all uh, Jeremy S. is in the chat. He says we still love Tyler. Yeah, yeah. So um, yeah. there's a lot of good guys over at T Tag and and the Firearm Blog and all those places. Even though they uh, clickbaited me the other day <laughs> with Patrick R. Where they did, I don't oh, really? know if you saw this. Yeah, they did like a clickbait thing where they uh, they fronted like they fired him. He was over at Brownells. So, oh really. Yeah, it was cool. It was funny. I totally fell for it because I saw the, I saw the article in the beginning, and there was like a, a video thing there, but you couldn't get through to the video. So the info was only written in the description. But I guess oh. there were so many people hitting it because if you see like, we fired Patrick up there, you're like what the hell, <laughs> right? It's like you're saying this is, it's a touchy subject, you know. And we're connected to our bloggers and gun yeah. guys and YouTubers, etc. So yeah. It so was the a long thing. story, like, um, I'm still really good friends with all the guys at T Tag. Um, I introduced Nick Leghorn to his wife. Um, I performed their marriage, so like, we're still very close. You Most performed Nick- their marriage? Oh yeah, you mean, yeah. You performed the marriage ceremony. Yeah, I'm ordained. So. Oh cool. I, okay. 
so I, I performed it. Most of Nick's guns are like four feet away from me in my safe over here. Um, obviously, you know, as Jeremy said, um, there's, there's no love lost there. So like, um, the writers should, and I you are should still... charge people to come to your place and molest Nick, Nick's guns. So I've actually so down for that. Of Nick's guns. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So Nick had told me, he was like, Hey man, uh, like Nick's, I, a good guy. Uh, Nick's good people. He's uh, but he was like, yeah, I'm thinking about selling some stuff. I could use the money. So like I brokered like four or five transactions for him. I actually have a, a scar of his I'm trying to sell. Um, uh -oh. What kind of, what scar? 16, 17? It's a 17. It's an SBR though. Um, oh, SBR. Okay. There might be someone out there that's looking for a scar 17, 17 SBR. Right? I've been trying to broker the deal between Mike Pappas of Dead Air um, oh, okay. and Nick because Mike really loves Nick. Like Mike has a big crush on Nick. He thinks Nick's super cool. And so to own a, you know, an SBR that says like Nicholas Leghorn Trust, like that's a big deal. Yeah, um, it is. I mean, a, you know, he's that would be a trophy for the collection. So, right. For um, lots of people. So if he doesn't want to make it happen, let us know. So someone else can get yeah. in on that. Yeah. You know? I, mean, I probably need to go poke both of them again and remind them that yeah. they need to buy it. So, yeah, um, hurry up and make it happen. So we took a lot of things. Ultimately what I was trying to say was I only wrote about guns. I wanted to write about different stuff. Um mm -hmm. when I sat down and thought about what I wanted my site to look like and what I wanted to write about. Um, I broke it into three categories. So I think you'll see those on the site. Um, gear. So like gear and gun reviews were kind of my bread and butter for a really long time. It's what I really enjoy. Um, I like taking kind of an objective look at stuff. So um, gear was kind of the big thing. Um, the like guidance section or really just how to like there's a lot of knowledge that I've picked up along the way and a lot of stuff I'm continuing to learn and that's stuff that I wanted to share that's um you know I, I can't tell you how many times I go to YouTube to look up a video tutorial on how to do something um and so I wanted to kind of put a lot of the information that I had gleaned over the years into the guidance section um yeah. and then the why and for me the why was the part those are the things that I really enjoyed writing. Um, those are mostly hunting stories, um, you know, the odd obituary here and there to, you know, friends lost, stuff like that. Yeah. Um, getting into really the much more emotionally raw things, um, that's what I really wanted. Like, that's the thing that I love writing the most. Um, but it's that's not the sort of thing that you can write all the time. So. Uh, I wanted to kind of break up the site into those three major categories and then, you know, there's other stuff in there, but those are kind of the three big things that I wanted to stick to. Yeah, I think that's a good way to go. You know, obviously we've got people that are, you know, that follow what we do because of the guns. Um, and I'm, I'm going to throw up a gun right now. Someone just put a gun in my hand. Babyface P is actually here. Can you, do you recognize this gun? You're a Texan, so you should be into wheel guns. Let's see if you recognize well, what this gun is. Um, let's see. It's all if you grainy. Can. Oh, it's oh yeah. Your 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 internet's probably come in really terrible, but mine mine's terrible. Is that that's one of them? there Smith and Wessons, is it not? No, it's a Colt. It's a Colt Python. All right, all right. See there. There you go, Colt Python. <laughs> okay, I guess you're not that much into. That's okay. I wouldn't know either. So I just know because Babyface put it in my hands. Very nice Colt. I have not seen it. He actually bought this. Was in a fire. Really. Yeah, I think he bought this for, was it 900 bucks? Yeah, it was in a fire, and he rehabbed it and all that kind of stuff. And then this beautiful coating on here was done by, who's the guys again? Um, there's, a, there's a company here in Florida that, Ford's Custom. yeah, Ford's Custom, which they're, they're on Crystal River here. They did, I mean, it's really beautiful work. I'm looking at it. You really, there's no way you guys are going to be able to tell. Um, check out Babyface P. He doesn't have a lot of social media. He needs to make a video about this because it looks really good. But anyway, what I was saying is that, you know, we're into the guns, but I think people also like to know the personal stories and things like that, right? You know, they want to they wanna connect to us. That's why I'm doing this, where we can talk about guns, but we can talk about other things. Because as gun guys, we're into a lot of stuff. We care about our families. We care about um, Well, you can only see so things. many ARs before. Yeah. I just, you know, like. Yeah, before you get um, snow blinded. <laughs> A shot show. Yeah, it's, it's just not, it's, it's a little overwhelming. You get kind of burned out on it. Um, the people, I forget who I was talking to about this the other day, the people behind the kind of 
infamous folks are way more interesting to me. Like mm -hmm. um, the example I gave was like Kevin Brittingham is very famous, right? Like he's a he's a recognizable guy in the gun industry, right? He is. Uh, Who the hell is that? Okay, well, he founded AAC. You've probably heard of that. Oh, yeah. And oh, okay, yes. I know who you're going to talk about. This is like... The, which made the fix, you know, which, like, these are cool things. And Kevin's a very well-known yeah, guy. Yeah, he's a... Isn't he at Q, the Q or something like that? Or just Q? He founded Q, right. Yeah, okay. I do but, know who that is. Like okay. One, one level back from Kevin are a bunch of really interesting people who are, like, making the day-to-day -day stuff work. Um, and those are, like... Those are very interesting people. Those are, like... People write about Kevin, like Rob Curtis wrote a really cool thing in Recoil about Kevin last year. Um, and I would love to write something about Kevin. Kevin's an interesting guy, mm -hmm. but way more interesting are the people behind him. Yeah. Um, like the, Ethan Lassard, who is like head of development, Ethan's a very interesting guy. Like he's, right. a, he's got, he's, he's a little weird, you know, but he's like a really smart guy and he can make, you know, like machinery, do all kinds of weird stuff. Like. Um, the most interesting very, guys are a little weird and a little nutty and crazy. Exactly. But, yeah, exactly. That makes them interesting. Um, I, I agree with you. I think always the people like with me, I think, you know, I, I know there's lots of, uh, that, well, there's a few gun guys that I know that have turned down reality shows. Um, nobody offers me a reality show. I, I guess I'm not that big or whatever. That's too but, bad. I, if I had a reality show, I would bring you on. Yeah, well, I, what I was going to say is I think it would be interesting to do a reality show on me just to see Lola. Because if you follow her and you follow the conversations that I have with her and it's how she tells me off sometimes and all the craziness that we yeah. go through to do this, I think you'd find it very interesting. <laughs> well, behind every yeah. strong man is a stronger woman. Absolutely. Yeah, amen. Yeah, Lola's back there uh, kicking asses every day. <laughs> You know, so you know what? Um, I don't know how how we got into whatever we're into. It doesn't matter. Here, do you know what? Let's talk about how you and I met. Now, when how long have we known each other? It's been years. We met uh, at that TACCON thing. Um, okay. Yes, the TACCON trigger way back. That's like four years ago. Five years. I don't know. Four years at least. At this are point, they, are they still a thing? The TACCON. Tac um, I think they're still out there as a company. They're still. Okay. They're, uh, someone someone could let me know. So far as I know. They're still out there making triggers and stuff like that. Um, they're smart guys. I know that um, the, the, the trigger of business has changed over the last four years, right? It's gotten very competitive. Yeah. yeah. It, I thought their stuff was cool. Like, I, there is, well, they had the assisted reset trigger thing years before anybody came out with like binary triggers, which are the hotness um, now. Mm -hmm. um, I never really got it. Like I didn't, I, 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 that like price premium for the um, assisted reset trigger never made sense to me, but they're 241. That was a cool trigger. That was like the single stage yeah. and two stage trigger. I thought that thing was super cool. Yeah, that um, is cool. Um, and the, you know, now, I mean, with the technology and everything exists, there's lots of, I think the best triggers that are out right now are the binary slash, like echo trigger, which, you know, the echoes from Fostec and the binaries from uh, Franklin Armory. Um, I think those are cool triggers. What do you think about those? I don't like them. Uh, no, why? You I, this, makes, this, makes me feel, this makes me feel like an old fogey. You know, like, <laughs> like an old bitty. You uh, don't need them to our triggers. <laughs> pretty much. Like, I, I've seen some very fast people run single stage triggers very fast um, yeah. and safely. So I, yeah, knock on wood, um, I've only had one negligent discharge and it was with a binary trigger. Um, okay. And I like released and it didn't release and then it released. Um, nothing bad happened, like gun was pointed down range, everything was safe, but. Uh, what company was that from? I honestly don't remember it was at SHOT Show. So whoever was demoing them at that, uh, whatever, the not machine, Range 702 or whatever, mm -hmm. um, I forget who invited us. But okay. um, I just thought it was stupid, and I didn't like it, and they're really expensive. And so I just feel like for that money, you could buy, like, a quality single-stage trigger from somebody who just makes good single-stage triggers, and then you could buy a lot of ammo and practice your double tap. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, you know, I think it's obviously not for everyone. I agree with you. I could shoot pretty fast without without any assistance. Or, I mean, just a standard trigger, right? I can shoot pretty fast. Um, that's writing the reset. I, I don't think um, I don't think it's necessarily for everyone, and it's also not the same as full auto. We do have a video coming out on this um, shortly, which means whenever I actually edit that thing. But we did shoot one last weekend where we did a test because um, we had like an M16 and then we had a um, the Echo Trigger from Fostec and then we had the Binary Trigger from Franklin Armory and we compared them. There's really no comparison to an M16. No, there, there there's not. And I think that was kind of my bigger issue is that like, it we should all come out with it and say like, hey, it's a replacement like it's a faux machine gun trigger, which is fine. Like that's awesome. Um, mm -hmm. But just call it what it is. Yeah, and dudes, it, dudes out there are not agreeing with you. I think Babyface is not agreeing with you. There's probably a few guys out there. Babyface is right here in the room, by the way. If you want me to smack him, <laughs> yeah, you want to smack I, someone in the back of the head and you can do I'm, it. I'm an old, I'm an old bitty uh, here. Going yeah, to listen, bed by I think it's for, I think it's you know, there's people out there that want to be. You definitely get more control with an M than you would with an M16 if you don't know what you're doing, right? I mean, I think if you just start shooting full auto and uh, and you're not aware of what's gonna happen, it could knock you back off your feet a little bit. It still does it to me. If you're thinking about what you're doing and all that, you can get a decent amount of control. I find that those triggers are a little bit more controlled and, you're, and you could throw lead down range really fast, you know, if you wanted to, but it just depends on your shooting style, you know, so. yeah. I I um I'm a believer in the every hit counts. You know, mm -hmm. you're you're responsible for every round down range type thing. Mm -hmm. Um, I also reload most of my own ammo, so mag dumping stuff I spent hours loading kind of stuff. Yeah, well, yeah, well, that's true. If you're gonna do this, if you're gonna get into these triggers, I I wouldn't even complain about the cost of it because you're gonna burn way like you know maybe ten, twenty, a hundred times that just on the ammo. But, um, you know, I think guys like the idea of having that ability that you could flip that switch, throw a bunch of ammo down range. Um, you know, I think it, I don't I, I don't think everyone has to run out there and get it. Yeah, find somebody who has one and then shoot there. Yeah. The most fun I've had with them is with 22s, by the way. If you put that in something that's 22, it's freaking awesome. Yeah, uh, 22 machine guns are super, super duper unbelievably fun yes uh, and I've only I think I've only shot maybe a, a actual uh, full auto 22 I think I've done it once a couple of times um, but so that and and as we said you're not coming to the exact speed but you can you can throw a bunch of 22 down range it doesn't it doesn't uh, hurt your pocket that much um, you know not too bad not too bad so let's see okay babyface is handing me more stuff here are you into suppressors Yes. Okay. Very much so. All right. So let's see what's he, what is he handing me here? Oh, this is uh, an Omega from Silencer Co. They don't they don't yeah. like when I say uh, Silencer Silencer Co. I say Silencer Co. Which they don't like. But I don't really. Silencer Co. Yeah, it doesn't really matter to me. You know, they're not like yeah. paying me or giving two craps about me. Pretty much. So I don't really. I will say what I like. But this is oh, this is cool, man. This is lighter. Than I thought it would be. I have one of those guys. That's oh. a little Sig five five six can. Those were very hard to find for a while. Oh, you've got a Sig five five six. I do have a Sig five five six can. I waited for a very long time to get one of those. Yeah, the, to get the Sig one, right? Yeah. So here you go. Here's the Sansa yeah. Co one. You you guys will see that since apparently Babyface has collected these. How many did you get, Babyface? A bunch of suppressors came in. You yeah, <laughs> yeah. He's got he's got a bunch of them. Uh, looks like the Octane forty five oh, cool. has come in, and uh, what's this one? Uh, Octane nine. So we're gonna put those on some things. You guys will see that those in videos. Um, I'll I don't know. You can pop them out of the box if you want to. Thanks. Yeah. So how are you feeling about suppressors? Are you happy about those? You like if those? I, if I <laughs> could put a can on every gun I had, I would do it. So you're all for suppressors coming off the NFA, right? Yes, I would love for that to happen. Uh, I think that it's not going to happen for a very long time. But yes, I would love for that to happen. That would be super great. 
Yeah. So why do you think, I mean, we've had this discussion on here. I think it's kind of like a boondoggle that's, that um, maybe it was kick-started by the suppressor industry, but it's pretty much destroying the suppressor industry right now because well, everyone's yeah. waiting. So the, the, the ultimate culprit there is the ASA. Um, and, uh, you know, the, they really pushed the message hard that, like, as soon as Trump was in office, it's a done deal. Uh, Hearing Protection Act is as good as done. Like, that was very much the message. And, um, well, you know, you had two really terrible things happen. You had 41F happen, and you had this run-up of, like, crazy... Everyone trying to get their stuff under the radar because of the rules yeah. change. Yes, you had just crazy numbers of people buying cans. And then you had the election, and then Trump won, and ASA had been coming out and saying, oh, man, as soon as Trump's in, HPA is as good as done, and just... Yeah, so ASA, for people off. who don't know, that's American Suppressor Association, right? Yes. Yes, and, which um, is owned by Silencer. Oh. <laughs> yeah. yeah, these are the other cans right here for you guys who want to see that. I can see. It. Did, you go, did you do this when you said owned by Silencer Co? Um, yeah. Oh well, it's a, it's. Um. Yeah. Okay. I did the air quotes. I guess in my mind, <laughs> I, my hands were full. But basically, it's it's an organization that they started, right? Yeah. Well, sort of. So, um, Kevin Brittingham, who I mentioned earlier, um, was one of the founders of ASA. Um, along with Josh Waldron from uh, Silencer Co. It's very interesting to hear Kevin talk about the ASA just because mm -hmm. Kevin uh, is no longer a part of the organization. So um, uh -oh. mm -hmm. who knows what all went on there. But what Kevin Drama said, in the LBC, that's what went on. And, and you should interview Kevin if you want to talk about that side of it. But what is interesting is that Kevin's original proposal had been to transition silencers away from the traditional NFA paperwork and get them into just a NICS check so that you essentially still had an NFA item, but you didn't have the wait time. So you, you just had a NICS check like you would for any other gun. Okay. Um, so you would still have that $200 tax stamp. You still have the $200 tax stamp, but he, um, I think rightly said that the thing that pisses people off the most about silencer ownership is the weight. And the fact that you pony up, you know, a thousand dollars and then you wait. I mean, right. I actually checked NFA tracker today. The wait is almost a year. So you it's give still, somebody a thousand. It's still high. It's still high like that a year. Yeah. I mean, you're in a post 41 F world. So like it's coming back down, but you do have people who waited a year to get their silencer. Yeah. I think um, Babyface waited a year, right? Babyface? Yeah. He, he was in the year category. He just got it. Yeah. And, they, and so they paid, they paid in full thousands of dollars and then waited a year to get their thing. And so what Kevin had originally proposed was that if you just went to a NICS check, you could eliminate that wait time and people could go in and they'd still pay the tax, but they would get their thing that same day, just like you would with a, with a gun that you go purchase. Right. That's and, a big, that's a big thing that's stopping lots of people out there from getting into this, putting up like, dropping a thousand bucks or whatever it is to buy a suppressor, then 200 bucks on top of that and then waiting forever. And so the, um, there, his plan had been, let's do this as phase one. Like let's get the ATF to go to Nick's check or suppressor ownership so that you still pay the $200 tax stamp, but you get your stuff the same day. And then phase two is to scale back the tax and get them listed as an uh, AOW, so they're a $5 tax stamp instead of a $200 tax stamp. And then let the industry, you know, mature and grow, and then go after getting them completely removed from the NFA. But, you know, people talk about how they didn't like being on like the registry or whatever. Um, realistically, the wait time and the tax are the two biggest gripes that people have. If you ask anybody why they're not buying a silencer right now, it's, well, I don't want to wait a year or... Yeah. I don't want to pay a two hundred dollar tax to the government to go own something, right? Yeah. So if you remove those two things, you remove probably eighty percent of the bullshit that goes along with owning a suppressor. So um, that was kind of the original plan that Kevin had submitted to the ASA. Um, and then, you know, today's version, like who knows what happened in that period of time, right? But the the new thing is like we'll just completely remove suppressors from the, the NFA. 
And that's a big political thing. Like that takes a lot of political willpower to go up against, you know, anti-gun senators and, you know, groups like Moms Demand Action or Every Town or whoever else to try to get them removed from, from the NFA. Um, incrementalism is probably a better way to go after it. Yeah, I think it was something that was pretty easy for them to say, and then it kind of caught fire, and everyone was like, what? You know, this is going to happen, and then they just stopped buying these things. And uh, I think a couple of companies have sold themselves. Some companies are going to go out of business. Well, um, Chemtech just got bought, um, so that's probably one of the biggest names. Yeah. I mean, they're huge. They're one of the oldest silencer companies, and they got bought. Um a lot of, I mean, the sales, if you look behind the scenes, the sales stuff that comes in, we're an FFL as well as an SOT, and we see like all kinds of crazy sales things coming in from the companies. So that's an indication that, um, you know, it's like tough times for them. They're trying to drum up more business. It wasn't an easy business to do in the first place. And uh, the good news is that it's for most of those manufacturers, they're a cash only business, they're a cash funded business. So they didn't, you know, have big lines of credit or debt um, that they had to service. They could just, you know, they, they paid cash for everything, right? So um, if there is a downturn, they didn't have, you know, payments on equipment or anything like that. Really, personnel costs was the biggest one they had out there. Yeah, hopefully for most of them. I'm sure there might have been some people out there who believed, who got high off their own supply and really believed that this was going to happen soon and maybe said, hey, we'll go out there and take out some loans and ramp up equipment yep. and maybe hire people and stuff like that. It's interesting to see that Silencer Co. went um, almost right in the beginning. They were like, yeah, we're cutting staff. Yep. You well, know. they were, I think they were running like three shifts anyway. Um, mm -hmm. They were running, they were running at capacity, so. Yeah, okay. All right, so let's, uh, you know, I wanna go through a couple things here. Lola, um, Lola wants, to, wants you to talk about um, cooking what you kill. I, I know that's something that you cover a lot, right? I try. Yeah. So um, I am not the foremost expert on cooking what you kill. Um, the foremost expert in my mind is Hank Shaw. Um, he is a pretty well-known wildlife uh, chef. So he, uh, he forages for his own plants and stuff and then also uh, kills everything or cooks everything that he kills. So. If you are looking for where I get most of my inspiration, Hank Shaw is the guy. Um, but I'm a big believer in, uh, in eating what I kill. I, I, yeah, I pretty much eat everything that I what's kill the, now. Oh, so, okay, I was gonna ask you, what's the ratio? So like, is it 100% of what you eat is something that you've killed oh, or, I, I mean, wish. do you go to I a wish. grocery store? <laughs> do you go to no, the meat market? I, I, I definitely go to the grocery store. Um, I would very much like to be in a place where I, um, I eat a hundred percent, uh, or, you know, a hundred percent of the protein that I, that I take in or animal protein that I eat is from animals that, you know, I either raised or, uh, or hunted. Unfortunately, that's not a reality for me. Um, it would, it would require me to make a lot of fundamental changes in my life and they're disruptive to a lot of other things that I, that I have as a bigger priority, but, um, I do eat what I kill. So when I do, go hunting uh that meat goes into the freezer and that stuff that uh, we end up eating throughout the year so so what are you like are you what's your ratio 50 50 or uh oh no shit no it's probably less than 10 percent um that's, that's actually still big for most people <laughs> yeah no, I mean, it's, right now so i i wish it were i wish it were at 25 percent or better i had um i don't know if i ever wrote anything about it but i know that um one of the things that I had uh, looked at, you know, kind of thinking about eating what I kill was that, um, you know, perfection can be the enemy of good, right? Mm -hmm. So like in an ideal world, yeah, 100% comes from it. But there's also something to be said for 10%, you know, that's still really mm -hmm. good too. And if you... Um, Absolutely. I try to, I try to take time, like uh, a lot of people think of, you know, venison as like ground up into spaghetti or you know, chicken fried backstrap, like those are the two things that you can do with it. Um, this year I made, um, and it's up on my website somewhere, um, I made venison stock and then made venison consomme for Thanksgiving. Oh, venison. So, venison is pretty good, man. Yeah, it is. And there's a lot more that you can do with the entire animal. So like 
I roasted all the bones and then I made stock from all those bones and I reduced that stock and I clarified it and I made consomme and served it at Thanksgiving and like blew people's minds. Like my family was just blown away at how good it was. And then when they found out that it was from a deer that I had killed a couple weeks ago, they were just like shocked, awesome. man. Like, yeah. Holy shit. Um, so being able to do that, I think is, um, that's a, that's a big thing for me. I wish that, um, I wish I could do more of that, but, um, I'm hoping. So I told you I'm going on a week long hunt in January during shot show. And, uh, I'm, my, I'm hoping that I'll get to cook a lot of what I kill there as well. Okay, cool. So we'll see some, uh, some blog posts go up on that, right? Yes. So I will be writing, uh, well, there'll be a week where I won't be writing cause I'll be going pretty hard at it. But, uh, when I get back, yeah, there'll be a lot a lot posted at my website about yeah. going hunting. So I'm, I'm going with a veteran's charity. Um, or, I, I don't like the word charity, I guess, but they are a charitable organization, a 501c3 called Veteran Outdoors. Uh, they're based here in Austin and I uh, worked with those guys for the last couple of years um, doing various volunteer activities uh, with them. In fact, um, I, went, um, I went on a road trip to Alabama and uh, took a wounded veteran uh, with me to his first precision rifle match. And uh, they're sponsoring my sabbatical for work. So my sabbatical requires that I do um, 160 hours of volunteer work. So um, my hunt with them is uh, satisfying that along with some other activities that I'm doing. So oh, very cool. I'd be remiss if I didn't mention Veteran Outdoors. They're an excellent organization. I've seen firsthand the work that they do with uh, with our nation's veterans. And uh, if you get the opportunity to support them in any way, whether it's financial or your time, um, you know, you and your, your, uh, your viewers definitely should, they're doing, they're doing good work. And it's called veteran outdoors. Veteran outdoors. Yeah. Awesome. Very cool. And you know, if, if, if you're, if I might give you a suggestion, if you're taking your phone with you, shoot us some video, shoot some, vi some, some Ooh. video, throw that up on the social medias, you know, I do plan on Instagramming pretty hard, um, during the hunt but uh, I will do a formal write-up once I get back. Yeah. So now let me hit you with this. This is one of the comments uh, from sure. R. Hendry, Robbie, who's uh, like a, a friend of the Hank Strange situation. And we were okay. talking about uh, eating what you kill. And here's his comment. I think we should talk about the new bacon-wrapped jalapeno popper flavored Lay's potato chips coming out soon. <laughs> what, do you, what do you think? Is that what? thing? <laughs> huh? Wait, what? 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 Bacon? Uh, yeah, I, I hope this is real, Robbie. This better be real. He says bacon wrapped jalapeno popper flavored Lay's potato chips. So, Dude, come on, yeah, is uh, it real? That's, hopefully, that's not fake news that Robbie yeah. made us with. It's not fake news. Okay, so there you go. That's pretty Lay's awesome. Bacon wrapped jalapeno popper flavored potato chips are exclusive to Walmart. I'll yes, that's how chat. Robbie. That's how Robbie knows he's a behind-the-scenes guy over there at Walmart. Actually, I don't know if I'm supposed oh, to I tell. I can't put any. I can't put any addresses in that chat. I don't know if I'm supposed to tell anyone, but maybe Robbie will hook us up with some of those. Robbie, you're, I know you're listening, so get us a bunch of those when those come out from Walmart, and I will give those away. <laughs> that would be. Awesome. I'll pay you back too. I'm not. You know. I'm not. I'm oh, not flag. asking you to get it with your own money. I will definitely pay for it. I don't eat bacon myself, but I will. You know, promote the eating of bacon. Uh, no bacon for you, though, Babyface. No, you're, no bacon. You're, you're, Babyface you're is not. Man. Babyface is not allowed to eat bacon <laughs> around me anymore. Uh, I, I, we've talked about that in the past. So, and here's another comment. Um, this is from Richard King. He says Tyler looks intimidating with that freedom beard. <laughs> so, Richard, it, do you know Richard? No, who's Richard King? Is this someone? Richard. I Richard King is uh, the photographer to the stars. He's the, uh, he's the man behind the lens for most of the pretty pictures that you see in all of the publications that you care about. So, oh, cool. Uh, oh, sweet. And he's, Rich and he's in here making comments. That's awesome. Yes, yes. Richard's, uh, Richard's good people. He, uh, he and I met um, at a SIG event a couple years ago and uh, really hit it off. Uh, anytime I'm in Atlanta, I go uh, spend the night at their house. He's got a oh, sweet. wonderful family. They they take good care of me. I actually shipped them some. Uh, I made some cookie dough and uh, froze it, shipped it to him, and uh, shipped him some uh, frozen tortillas. Yeah, you're very day. into food, by the way. We should try to get Richard on then. Have him come on and talk about photos. Yeah, he's a he's a cool guy. He's done um, he's done a lot of cool stuff. I, I, I always, I'm always hesitant to talk about who his clients are because I don't know if I'm supposed to talk about them, but. Uh, right. 
he's a he's a very cool guy. He's very low key. I think you would be hard pressed to find anybody in the gun industry who has anything negative to say about Richard, which says a lot about him since this is the cattiest industry in the world. So, oh, absolutely. Lots of bitches um, up in the gun industry. I would be the first person <laughs> to admit that to you. It seems like everyone middle, will be all middle macho. Look like a, oh God. They make <laughs> middle school look like a cakewalk. Yeah, man. It's like some real, it's crazy. Very catty. Like you said, that's probably a more PC way of putting it. I'll just say there's lots of bitches. Up in up in the game, yeah, bitches. yeah, absolutely. And 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 if you know if you're offended, then that means you're one of those bitches. So there we go. <laughs> exactly, exactly. <laughs> so listen, uh, this is like kind of like a sad story. I want to switch over to this. I think I did share this with you. Um, yep. This this is um, there's a Spanish hunter, uh, a woman, female hunter in Spain. And she committed suicide recently because of cyberbullying from like anti-hunting people. Um, this article, I believe this is on the New York Post, but if you guys look this up, her name is, um, let me see, her name Melania is, Capitan. yeah, Melania Capitan, 27 years old, was her dead body was found on Wednesday. So it seems like she had a you know pretty good following, 39,000 followers on her Facebook page, and she was putting up hunting photos and stuff like that. I mean, which is legal. There's nothing wrong with it. We were just talking about uh, you know eating what you kill and all that kind of stuff. I don't, I, I don't get some people sometimes, you know. But so she's she got it seems like a lot of uh, flack from the anti-hunting people out there, right? And um, eventually took her own life which is really sad yeah i think um the uh i think the first thing to say about that is that um if you uh are are suicidal and you're considering hurting yourself or harming yourself um there are a bunch of great hotlines um out there for you and there's always people who are um you know who are, are ready to talk with you um so if you find yourself in a situation where um you know you feel like you're you're close to harming yourself or or harming someone else um you know reach out and get help and and there are a lot of people who who want to help you um you know and i think anybody here probably feels that way so um i think that's probably the really the saddest part about it is that um that young lady took her life um and I, I think there's probably a lot of people in her life who wish that she would have reached out and they could have, you know, had a chance to talk. Um, yeah, even I, I know sometimes I think, I think it, people feel like there's no one out there that actually cares about them. But there are. There are people, you know, there are people yeah. that care about you. You just need to, um, you know, try to reach out to them. And in this case, there's definitely, you know, I know if this is pressure from, from the left, from gun grabbers, from anti-hunting or vegan or you know, whatever, um, animal rights folks out there, there are people who are also on her side of it and, and there's nothing wrong with hunting, right? Yeah, and, and by the way, sorry, I just had to Google the number, I don't know it offhand, but um, the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline is uh, 1-800-273-8255. So um, if, yeah. if there's not somebody close at hand, you can always call um, that number and they're available 24 seven. So um, moving on from that, like, uh, I have this theory that like um, we as a society have gotten away from um, people punching you in the mouth when you say mean shit. Like um, I grew up in a very rural part of Texas where like if you mouthed off to somebody, um, that person hit you in the face and then you both went to the principal's office and you like you got in trouble for saying something mean to them and they got in trouble for hitting you and but like you work your shit crazy. out, <laughs> you know? Exactly. Um, yeah. And now, like, and by trouble, like, maybe you got, like, you had to go to in-school suspension. Or, like, my high school still paddles kids, so, like, who knows? Mm -hmm. um, but I feel like we've gotten to this place that everybody feels like their, um, their opinion matters so much that they should be able to say whatever mean, hurtful shit they want. Um, without thinking about other people's feelings first um, and thinking about how what they're about to say actually impacts those people. Um, and I know that that's kind of circular logic, but um, I feel like as a society, we've really gotten away from just like common fucking decency and just being nice to people. 
and understanding that like we're probably not going to like agree on everything but it's totally fine to just say like hey i don't agree with you um yeah but you know if you don't agree with someone to stay the hell out of their face i think that we have people trying to pretend like they're going away from violence and we're human beings uh the violence comes uh you know uh, parts and parcel, if that's the right thing. I feel like that's the wrong thing, uh, the, the wrong saying. I don't know. I'm sounding like Lola here, just making up sayings. But, you know, it's it's part of the package that comes along with human beings, right? Violence. Yeah, and, and I think that um, we also um, – the, the flip side of that is that it, we live in a society where I think everybody feels like they're under the microscope and it's hard to um, – it's hard to deal with your reactions the right way. Maybe is the best way to say it. Um, it, it. I think people find it harder to process their own emotions and they feel less in touch, even though we're more connected than we've ever been. Um, it's harder to, to process and digest those, those emotions. I mean, people have been saying mean shit to other people for years. Um, the, the problem now is that like, uh, it's, it's hard to retort. Um, again, like when I was four years old, it was pretty well ground into me that like, if you mouth off to a kid who's bigger than you, he might hurt you, you know? Mm -hmm. And so like, it got pretty um, like hardwired there in my brain that, uh, you know, maybe think before you say mean things. And if you're going to say mean things, know that maybe somebody hits you in the mouth. Um, we've gotten away from that part of it. And then we've also gotten to the part where people don't know how to really digest negativity. Um, they don't know how to um, let that roll off of them or take it on. I mean, like, People say mean things. To, I've been, I mean, like, I'm a writer on the internet. Like, people have been saying mean shit to me on the internet for six years. Yeah, um, there's no way around it. Gun guys, not even anti gun guys. Yeah, gun guys. Exactly. I mean, like, people within the industry telling me that I'm a, you know, a dumbass or, uh, I don't have it. It's in my house. I have a lower that I've engraved the meanest thing anybody called me on the internet every year. So, like, at the end of the year, I go to my dealer, we hook up my rifle and the laser engraver. <laughs> and they engraved the meanest thing anybody called me that year. Um, okay. But, uh, you know, like, there, there's not a, like, a lot of people, I think, lack the skills and capacity to deal with um, people telling them they're an idiot or telling them that what they do isn't right or whatever. Um, you know, I think that's, uh, that's an important part of it as well. So um, that's, that's hard. And then from the hunting perspective, like, I, um, I, I find that most people are just a little ignorant and I feel like a little bit of education goes a long way. And a lot of times you just have to hold up a mirror to people's hypocrisy. Um, I actually had a discussion with a coworker the other day who um, was asking me what I was going to do on my sabbatical. And I told him I was going to go on a week long hunt. And she said, isn't it so terrible that you're killing all those animals? And I, <laughs> I said, are you a vegan? And she said, well, no, I'm not a vegan. And I said, so you eat meat. And she said, well, that's different. And I was like, well, no, not actually. I mean, like it, it's, it's what, worse in a lot of ways. I said, do you, do you partner with like a local farmer and you, you ensure that the, you know, the cow that you're, you're eating or the pig you're eating, um, was sustainably raised and everything. She said, no, I, I go to HEB, which is our local grocery store here. And I said, well, that's like, that's like cage fed cage raised yeah, meat. You know? That's like, a food mill. You know, it's like a, like a puppy mill. <laughs> Yeah, I was like, you know, the yeah. deer that I'm going to kill in this hunting season, this fall, um, is only going to have one bad day. Um, and it's going to go by pretty quickly. You know, like I, I practice all year and I, I maintain proficiency with firearms so that um, during my season I make one-shot kills. And the animals that I choose to kill die immediately um, with, with no suffering. Um, I spend a tremendous amount of time and effort and money to make sure that that happens. Um, in that way, I'm more connected to my food than that girl who had the audacity to tell me that, you know, I'm a terrible, shitty person for hunting. Um, yeah, but that's just the fucked up world that we're instead, living in now. But instead of telling her that she's a terrible, shitty person, I just said, hey, like, you know, do you think it's possible that, like, maybe the deer that I'm going to kill has, like, one bad day? Um, and then if we're both committed to eating protein, that, like, that's a pretty decent way to go. Like it was running around the forest and it was very happy. And then the lights just went out, you know, um, versus the alternative, which is to die of um, starvation from overpopulation or 
um, you know, old age, like it's not like in Bambi, like deer don't curl up in the forest and go to sleep, you know, like they get mauled to death by like coyotes and shit. Like that's, yeah. Yeah. That's how circle that's of how life. <laughs> that's how deer die in the in the in the real world. Um, yeah. So, not you know, to like, mention like all the steroids and things like that that you know go into the food that the rest of us eat. You know that creates that, all the problems that we have. That's the that's the other great tact for dealing with people who are anti hunting but still eat meat. Is like, well, yeah. how much do you pay in stores for like free yeah. range organic? ethically harvested yeah. ethically but you know raised. i don't even care if they're vegan i'll tell you why man because look you you can be a vegan are you saying that a plant is not alive because it is alive it has life you know it's not um i i think is the is the difference there uh i think you can i think you can argue that i mean there's 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 relatively intelligent plants out there there they may seem slower to us because they they live longer and maybe they they move slower but they definitely have intelligence and they do things. In some cases, they're trying to kill our asses, you know. And they kill. They hunt things. I, I, uh, I will digest this information. How about that? Um, yeah. So what I will say is, I, I have, um, I have a lot of respect for people who are vegan, mm -hmm. um, because of their feelings on meat um, and their feelings mm -hmm. on um, kind of putting their money where their mouth is on, um, you know, the ethics of of eating animal protein. Um, I think that's great and I, I'm all about it. And I think that if you're, if you're against, um, consuming animal protein and you're a vegan, rock on. Yeah. I'm not, I'm um, not knocking it. I'm just saying that plants are alive. Yeah. So. Yes, they are alive. Yeah. We can both agree on that. Yeah. See, look at us, look at us just having a slight disagreement, but then still yeah. being friends. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> no, let me get my guns. Hold on a second. <laughs> Exactly. You know, um, I, yeah, I think, listen, I'm not, people can do, you know, for the most part, I believe people can do what they want to do. And I'm not knocking being a vegan. I tried it for a little bit. Um, um, so, and then someone says, uh, so Lola is telling me hunting is necessary now that there's no natural predators for game animals. That's like population control for, in, in lots of cases, right? It is. Yep. So for, uh, for the state of Texas, uh, consistently year over year, um, we find that hunters are not taking enough whitetail and, uh, you know, the population numbers continue to grow. Um, and there's more, more that hunters could do to, you know, reduce that population. Yeah. In fact, the hunt that I'm going on for a week, I keep harping on this, is a call for a piece of land that has become overpopulated with deer. And it's become overpopulated because they didn't allow hunting on it for 80 years. Um, yeah. And the population can't keep itself in check. They have animals who are sick, who are, you know, malnourished, who are, you know, prone to disease. Uh, that's the sort of thing that hunters can come in and actually, you know, make a, make a positive impact on. Absolutely. Now, I know that, you know, what you said, I think, when the beginning of this, when we were talking about this, I totally agree with you. I'm not trying to make light of it here. But to me, the second, the second, I don't know, maybe the third most tragic thing, in some people's, in, in some people's cases, it's going to be the first most tragic thing. Uh, a young, beautiful gun chick who is into hunting, not in the world anymore. I think that's kind of sad. <laughs> yep, I do too. I think um, I think anybody who's I think anybody who's a human who's not in our world anymore is is sad. Um, yeah, that the loss of life um, is always hard. Is no matter what the circumstances are or who that person yeah. was. Yeah, maybe we need like a gun match or something like that because you know there's lots of gun guys out there that tell me that it's tough to find women that are into guns or believe in the second amendment and even you know in her case maybe if she had I don't know how the gun community is in Spain someone that knows better than me can fill me in on that but you know maybe if she had more of a community like we do just be like look at these fucking fucktards that are hating on me and get over it you know Yeah they could go out and have a beer and feel better yeah. So, is there is there a gun date thing? I don't know. You know how there's like Jew date, <laughs> and then there's, uh, uh, there's like farmer a farmer date. Farm, farmers only. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, farmers only. <laughs> um, I, I know there's I like think, a black one. I'm not even sure what the black one's called. Uh, if if you uh, I think if you read the comment section of any Instagram gun bunnies page, it's pretty apparent why a lot of men are not dating a lot of uh, women with guns. Um, <laughs> okay. There's a lot of not so smooth dudes in the uh, in the comments. Section. In the gun world, yeah, guys don't know how to. Uh, they don't have game. Their game's not good. The game is weak. Yeah, yeah. They don't. They're not hunters of romance. 
Yeah. Right? I exactly. guess that's how we could put there's, it, you know? There's a, there's a little bit of nuance there, and they're just not having it. Yeah, you know, and that, I think, um, I want to look this up. I didn't send you, um, I didn't send you a link of this, but um, I'm going to look this up. Uh, I think... Uh, let me see. I'm going to go to Routers. Routers has an article on this. Sperm count of Western men plummeting. Plummeting. Breaking news. So mm. I guess this is from London Routers. Sperm counts in men from America, Europe, and Australia, and New Zealand have dropped by more than 50% in the last 40 years, researchers said on Tuesday. They also wow. said the rate of decline is not slowing. Both findings and meta-analysis bringing together various studies pointed to a potential decline in, main, in, in male health and fertility. So we can read on. You guys can look that up. What say you on this one, man? The sperm count's going down for dudes. I, I don't, I'm only aware of my own, and I was able to make a baby. So Yeah, that's all you, okay, so you're just, I've all you care couple, about as long as your sperm count's good. Huh? I've only got a couple of data points. So I really, yeah. uh, I'm not fully informed so, on it. Yeah. But, uh, so eating what you kill helps with the sperm count, apparently. <laughs> maybe, maybe that's the thing. Uh, that's what I'll start <laughs> telling people is that if you, uh, if you want to combat low T, um, you know, and you want to, uh, you want to have a high sperm count, you gotta, you gotta eat what you kill. Yeah, I don't know if your testosterone number has to do with your sperm number, but uh, I'm certain that there, I'm certain that the there correlation. Is, uh, there's a yeah. We'll have to ask Lola. Lola, does your testosterone number have anything to do with your sperm count number? You're the medical person. Yes, but there's a lot of environmental factors. Oh, she says, she gives such a like prototypical medical answer. She says, yes, but there's lots of environmental factors. Yes, but also. Uh, I know what it is. It's all those damn hipsters and tight, tight jeans. It's the tight pants. Yeah, man, that's going to kill your sperm breathe. count right there. And, of course, if we had, like, Alex Jones, he would say that it has to do with the freaking fluoride, fluoride in the water. And the Illuminati. Yeah, yeah what is it, the chemtrails? <laughs> the Illuminati, I mean. I can't, I, I, up, I can't keep up with all the things I'm supposed to be scared of. Yeah, I pretty much, you know what, I'm not surprised by this. I think, um, I don't, I think going into the future, we're not even going to have dudes, man. They're going to start castrating us at birth, and then the next thing you know, you won't even, you know. It'll be like Game of Thrones. You'll have all the, uh, do you watch Game of Thrones? Yes, I do. Um, I haven't caught up to the seventh season yet. Um, I'm like catching up. I'm building my way up. But I do. I, I read all the, the audio books. <laughs> but you'll, I read all the audio books. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> you have the, uh, That's how I listen to stuff now, man. When I'm on the road, I listen to audio books. So. You got the, the Unsullied. Um, you know, they're, yeah. uh, they're carved up. So. Yeah, I think that's going to be happening to us, man. I see this like um, this practice thing out there to bring down men, you know, and um, it's not surprising. And I think that it, uh, you know, maybe from what Lola's saying, I think that what's happening in the world today, you know, just mentally, even, you know, whether even if it's psychosomatic, all the things that are happening that are restricting boys from becoming men and doing the things they like to do. I wouldn't be surprised if we find out that those that those things are sending signals as well as what's in the environment, right? In the food that we eat, no joke. So I forget, where I, yeah, I'm so bad at citing my sources, um, which is the opposite of what you're supposed to do. But I read a thing a while back that said uh, some psychologist or sociologist, anthropologist had put together um, a theory that the reason why the lowest rate of incarceration among any population uh, was with Jewish men was because they have an actual ceremony to say you're a man now, you know, like there's a defined moment where you go from being a boy to a man. And it's now like you are, it's very clearly understood that now that you are a man, you have these responsibilities um, where there are not those cues in a lot of other cultures. And so a lot of young men have to really struggle to find their male identity and find out what it means to be male. In a lot of cases, um, you know, they're only, uh, reinforcement of like what being a male looks like is like to turn to crime or something like that. Um, mm -hmm. it's an interesting theory. I don't know if it actually bears yeah. out. I mean, I think, um, you know, I think most cultures had something that indicated that you're a man, you're coming of age and all that kind of stuff. Uh, I don't know what it would be for Americans here short of like, I guess if you lived in California and you went into your dad drove over the border and took you to Mexico or something to get a hooker. I don't know. But, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I know for me, definitely I, it was when, um, you know, I had to move out when I was 18. 
yeah. You know? I think I think that there's a there's a real stunting of that too because like um we have a society now that says that like you must go to college, you won't be successful um if unless you go to college. And college I found um and I think a lot of people do is is a place that uh really kind of promotes that that youth um not necessarily infantile behavior, but it is a place where you can escape the reality of adulthood. Yeah. Also, um, there's a lot of so social justice warriors out there in college now. I don't know about you. I mean, and I don't agree that everyone should go to college. I think it's a good thing for some people. And I think especially if you, um, you know, there's lots of things you can do if you don't know what you want to do. But one of the options you have if you don't know what you want to do with your life by the time you graduate high school, somewhere between 16 and 18 years old, if you don't know what you want to do with your life, then maybe someone else needs to make some options for you. You always have the military. If we're thinking about positive things that you could do, you always have the military. If you know, uh, you know, maybe you go into your own business, but you, but that takes you knowing what you want out of life. So I think it's a it's yeah. a decent option out there for people who don't know what they want, but not necessarily for everyone. Do you follow Mike Rowe at all? Are you familiar with any of his work? Mike he's Rowe, the, the, the Dirty Jobs guy? The Dirty Jobs guy, yeah. He yeah. spoke at uh, SHOT Show at the NSSF Dinner this year. Um, he has the Micro Works Foundation, and his, um, his thing is trying to uh, narrow the skills gap. Um, you know, there are, I think he quotes that there's like 2.1 million jobs that remain unfilled in the trades. Um, there are electricians and plumbers and... Um, carpenters and all kinds of things that people don't want to be anymore because they want to go to college. Um, it's not cool. Yeah. There's lots of things like, um, uh, the guys who make guitars. I have a friend of mine, his nephew went off to school to learn how to make guitars because people don't want to do that anymore. It seems like, Oh, that's no big deal. That's some pretty badass shit to be actually able to make a guitar, man. It's incredible. It's, it's unbelievable. And, um, you know, so I grew up in a very small town. I mentioned that. I grew up in a very tiny little town um, out west of Austin. And uh, like all the kids I went to high school with, uh, you know, went off to go be diesel mechanics and electricians and plumbers. Uh, and like a lot of them make more money than I do. Um, mm -hmm. Like I work in like a tech city doing a tech sales job. Um, and I, I went to a private college. Like I have a like my education costs a lot of money uh, and like they're making more money than I am and they're happier. Um, you know? Yeah, I get it. I, I like it, if you look at how long it takes to get an electrician or a plumber to your house, I think that, um, you know, if you're not satisfied with what you're doing, know that there's money still in the trades. Yeah, absolutely. I think, uh, I, you know what I think one of the problems is, is I think we all look at, we look at it from the money point of view and somewhere around, um, lifestyles of the rich and famous and then MTV cribs a lot of kids got ruined and think no I've got to make like multi millions of dollars every year when I'm out there and they focus on that and then they wind up making nothing they wind up even if they try to pursue those things they wind up maybe turning into a life of crime or doing crazy shit to win all this money when they could have done really really well just by getting into a trade like you said I mean yep. Listen, I know guys who are landscapers, man, own their own businesses, and they're landscapers, and they're fucking ballers. They're killing the game, man. They're yeah. killing it. Yeah. Uh, so. It's, uh, you know, it is. Let's talk about a gun thing. Can we talk about a gun yes, thing? Yes, absolutely. Yes. Hit us up with some gun stuff, man. What you okay, got? Okay. So right over here, we have to clear it. Uh-oh. Oh, oh, guns. 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 Yeah, because I don't want you to accidentally shoot me. Exactly. <laughs> If you follow Mod Outfitters, which is uh, Mike Pappas and uh, Gary Motherfucking Hughes, of formerly of Silencer Co., and uh, after their uh, departure of Dead Air Armament, this is their AK building company. So they uh, they build AKs. This and it's called what's the name of the company? Mod Outfitters. M -O -D. Mod Outfitters. Okay, cool. Mod Outfitters AK. Yes. So. Babyface is looking this up right now. <laughs> He's an AK. This is this is the Project Crime Gun, and I'll try to do one of those dramatic pans. Project Crime, and it's got a suppressor on it. It does. It has the PBS one from Dead Air. Oh, uh, the Dead Air. What was that? The Dead Air what? PBS one. The PBS Wolverine. one. Okay. Wolverine. The Wolverine. Okay, yes, Babyface knows about that. <laughs> All right, cool. He, he wants one. He wants one. This is a Polish underfolder, uh, which, whatever, I'm not a huge AK guy. What's most important about this is that it was uh, purchased from a uh, police evidence 
yeah. auction. And it's cool. uh, it's the crime gun, man. Uh, and if you follow, if you go to their Instagram page, you'll see how totally jacked this gun was. Like, so is this is this this particular gun that's a crime gun, or they're selling crime guns in general? This is the gun. This is the, uh, what kind of crimes did this gun do? Because I'm pretty sure it was a person. So but this was used by a person know. to commit crimes, right? They don't know, but they do know that it was in police evidence. That's okay. They purchased. Yeah, because you know, but it the, was, for the most part, we believe like, people people commit crimes. People kill people, not guns. Like, but this is a crime gun. Again, guns are innocent in this. Yeah. Tank. Yeah, a poor. This is a poor homeless crime gun that was abused. <laughs> it's not homeless anymore. Yeah. Um, but they brought it back to life. Uh, you know, the, the whole thing is that an AK is indestructible. If you look at the original pictures, it was caked in mud and grime and rust, and they uh, they hosed it down and brought it back to life and uh, shoots like a dream. Okay, so what's the features? It looks like they've painted it, right? Um... So this is actually the original. Uh, it got like a Duracoat finish before it was a crime gun. Okay. Um, so I had asked if they actually redid the finish or anything, and he said they didn't. Um, so... They, it was missing a couple parts. Um, it was missing a bolt. I think it was missing a dust cover. Um, or may have had the dust yeah, cover. Kevin, sure. Kevin, Kevin Dufresne says he followed that rehab on the gram, Instagram. Oh, cool. Yeah. Awesome. I, I so, still uh, feel like I have to say Instagram. I can't say the gram, but maybe because... On the gram? Yeah. I'm, I'm old. So they uh, brought the original furniture back. So it's wood furniture. Um it was pretty dried out, so we got a couple of coats of boiled linseed oil. Um, they cleaned it up, uh, found a bolt that would head space, and uh, brought it back to life. Sweet. So this is the crime gun, and I have it for review. Awesome. So have you shot it yet? I have not shot it yet. I uh, I actually have a range day tomorrow to go shoot it. So Oh, um, sweet. Okay, so this you're going to have stuff coming up. You're going to have stuff on the gram and Facebook and all your other things, right? I, I will. Um, I, I will. So uh, I I am looking for a home for that review. I haven't decided if that's going to be a just Tyler Key or if somebody wants to you know purchase that. Um, oh, so this is review, not necessarily going to be on uh, written by Tyler Key. It will be uh, in some form or fashion. Um, if uh, if somebody wants to post it on their own website, I am happy to chat about. Uh, yeah. You know, about so how, how much money do you need? A million dollars. Yeah, easily. Easy. I mean, we'll start there. Yeah. A million. Let's start at a million. You know, the easiest way to uh, to become a millionaire writing about guns is to start with $2 million, I think. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, you know, I'm just, I'm being facetious, obviously, because people, I'm sure people think like, oh, you're a gun writer, you've been doing this for years. You've probably, you just have a bunch of guns, made a lot of money, you have a lot of guns and ammo. Is that true? Not at all, man. Um if that had been true, I would have quit my day job a long time ago. Um, it's actually one of the most frustrating parts about um, writing about guns um, and producing. And, and I'm sure you know this. Um, I think, and, and please feel free to correct me if I'm wrong. There's, a, I think, an easier path, at least, or better understood path to monetizing your production on YouTube or on a video platform. Um, it's a little murkier. In, in the written world. Um, it probably, so. at this point, it's probably better for you guys. I mean, I think, yes, there is a path. Um, monetization is not as much as people think. Like, people think you make lots of money. I've got almost 10 million views on my YouTube channel, right? Um, 10 million views. I mean, if I made a penny for every one of those views, I would have a lot of money. Right. right? But I didn't. <laughs> Yeah. I think um, Lola was calculating this the other day, and all this time I've been doing YouTube videos. Have I made like thirty thousand dollars? Maybe no. Nope, I have. She said you haven't even made thirty. <laughs> maybe is it twenty? You made two hundred last month. Yeah. Uh. Well. Yeah. You don't even. Yeah. So I don't know if you heard her, but she said yeah, you made two hundred bucks last month from YouTube. So it's not really. I mean, I know that writers get paid per article. I don't know what they get paid. I don't think they get paid a lot of money. I've heard things uh, my, like a hundred bucks an article. My experience has been not much. Um, yeah, not much. It's a, it's a lot of not much out there, and that's what I think a lot of people don't understand. I always tell people, like, I'm doing YouTube. This is how I spend my money. I am doing it with the intention that I can live this way at some point in the future. Sure. And, and I think there's guys out there that do that, but really it has to, you have to have, like, a tremendous size. You I know, maybe you've got 10 million views. 
yeah, maybe you've got 10 million views a month and then you're doing, you know, you're kicking ass. You know? Yeah. So. I, I think that's, um, unfortunately, I, I think that all that will ever happen is that, um, I, and, you know, I think if you own your own website, you own all of your own content and you're big enough to do that, mm -hmm. there's money there. But um, I look at like, so I've got a couple of favorite websites, right? Um, Precision Rifle Blog is one of my favorites. Okay. Uh, Cal Vant is the guy that writes that. Um, he's a, based in West Texas. Um, Rifleshooter.com is another great one. Super great info. Um, all that stuff is published for free. Like Cal writes incredible content on Precision Rifle Blog. Like super well researched. It should be published in a book, right? Mm -hmm. um, he has a PayPal button. Mm -hmm. How many people are actually smashing the PayPal button and throwing Cal five or ten bucks for for what they've read? Unfortunately, you know? probably not a lot, but there it should be. You know, it's the best content on the internet mm -hmm. um, about precision rifle stuff. I mean, thoroughly well researched, vetted, scientific. It's amazing. Mm -hmm. um, there, it, it, that's really that's hard, and and that's something that like I think once my own website when it stops being a fledgling thing, hopefully grows to a big enough place that I can, you know, ask people for money for stuff like, Hey, you know, I hope you enjoyed this review. My hard costs in it are, you know, this many hundreds of dollars. And I would really love it if you, you know, pitched in a couple bucks my way. I think that'd be awesome. Yeah. Here's what I think. Here's what I think um, when it comes to buying things. Right. And I'm sure you've bought things in your life, even though you hunt a lot of things out there. You know, I think when people buy something, they typically buy the person selling them the thing. Yeah, that's true. So, that's a, a hard and fast rule of sales. Yeah, absolutely. So a long time ago, I decided to like, you know, put out my personality instead of just copying, try to be a cookie cutter version of other people out there doing things. I would just be myself, put me out there. And I, and I think that's what it is. I think people out there will identify with you. Like you have a really cool attitude and approach to everything. And I think the more that people, you know, maybe being a writer, you don't get to see this as much, but the more people see who you are and your personality, I think the more they will like you and people will identify with you and then support you because we are moving into a world where you don't have to have, you know, broadcast transmitters, you know, aerials, antennas or whatever it is people used to have in order to do this stuff. You don't have to have printing presses and all that to get your word out there. And, um, and I think that there are enough people that realize it, even if it's like 10% of your audience that does it, you could probably do really well. You know, at least enough to live because they appreciate what you do for them and the uniqueness of it because it's based on your personality. Yeah, I um, that's my hope. That's my biggest hope. Like, I would prefer to have um, a thousand really engaged readers who really come hang out and add and contribute um, versus ten thousand disengaged readers, um, more kind of casual readers. Um, I had really, and part of my hope in doing written by Tyler Key is that, um, which sounds, God, what a, he, there's no way you don't sound pretentious <laughs> when you mention your own well, It sounds name, like you know? a dick move, <laughs> like, uh, written by Tyler yeah, Key, it's like, bitch. Well, yeah. well, what Tyler Key likes to do, um, is I'm terrible. Tyler Key, anyway, bitch. I'm um, Tyler Key. I'm, I'm Tyler Key, bitch. <laughs> what, what I, uh, what I, my hope for my own website is that, um, that personality side gets to come through because there's a lot of stuff that I'm interested in that I never got to write about at T Tag. Like, you know, one of the things if you go to my homepage, you'll see that I put up my recipe for uh, for my chocolate chip cookie. Yeah. You know, that's not the sort of thing that I could ever write at T Tag, but it is a really good chocolate chip cookie recipe, and it is one that I've spent. Yeah, that's what years. I like about your stuff, man. Whenever I see your stuff, I always get hungry. <laughs> it's oh, like this. Good. Yeah. This, I, well, this I, dude is into I food like me. I think I like that. <laughs> <laughs> listen, food. Uh, um, listen, um, for me, it, obviously, there's the requirements of life, like breathing air, drinking water, you know, food. But then, uh, you know, there's and obviously there's things that help you enjoy life, like sex. But even though food is one of those things that we require, it's also like right there, right? It's, it's I think food sex. for me is um, besides sex one of the most intimate things that you can do with someone else because um, 
you know, you can survive whatever, 30 days without food, right? Mm -hmm. um, what, three days without water, 30 days without food. Um, if you have a meal with somebody, you have extended their life by some, you know, hours, maybe even a day, right? Mm -hmm. um, food is one of those things that, like, it's a fundamental, like, our ancestors had to eat food, you know, mm -hmm. like they didn't have Instagram. They didn't have video chat. They didn't have a no, tool. They had to right? sit around the fire or sit down around the table and actually talk to each other and, and they get had along to and see a dude face to face. If they were going to talk shit about him, <laughs> he was right there to stick the fork in their eye. And so, um, so, uh, I, I think like if, if you, um, if you feed somebody, you are saying like, I like you so much that I want to nourish you. Um, and so to cook a meal for somebody is a very, um, it's a very intimate thing because you're saying like, I believe so much in you that I want to, uh, I want to extend your life. I want you to thrive and succeed. Um, and so like food for me has always been like that, that the level of intimacy just below having sex with somebody. So like if, yeah. um, if, if I'm cooking you a meal, I care about you so much. Like, uh, yeah. I, I truly believe in you. So yeah. me sharing my cookie recipe is just letting people know, hey, if you swung by my website, I care about you a lot. Um, I think you're really great. Yeah, and there's lots of um, African cultures, at least. Um, e African cultures, Indian cultures, there's lots of cultures like that. No, not only do you eat with your food, but you eat out of the same plate or out of the same bowl. I know African cultures like that. Um, and someone else? Huh? You eat all the one meal out of one bowl, or you yeah, like so the so the table. so the different things are in different bowls, and people are putting their hands in there and eating and stuff like oh, that. Oh yeah, yeah. I know some people probably think, oh, that's gross, but there's like a symbolism in there, you know. Of course, yeah, yeah. absolutely. I think I don't know, man. Um, some people just eat to survive. Uh, luckily, I grew up in a family where food was pretty important. Um, yeah. My wife also comes from one of those families. Like, food is the central gathering thing, like Thanksgiving is my favorite holiday. Um, so, Yeah, I think we're all very connected to food. Um, I think like, for example, that's a way that Lola from her culture and who she is, she shows us like me and my sons that she cares or anyone like you just said, you know, if someone's over at the house and she's like, oh, I want to feed you, then that's an indicator that she cares about you. You know, cares about and, you more than anything, you know, like right. I'm putting down what I'm doing because I want to feed you. Yeah, and then on the flip side of that, you can ask her if I'm pissed off, I won't, I won't eat. <laughs> oh really? Like if, yeah, if I'm mad at someone, I won't eat anything from them because this, oh, to me, is just like a lot of emotions and everything connected with this, you know. So if you're mad and you're fighting and all that kind of stuff, and they cook something, it goes into that, you know. It's you're like that plate away. Yeah, that well, it's like the vibrations and everything go into it. It's really, I think, to us as human beings, like you said, it's more than just you know soily and green or whatever that you're just exactly. you know you're just drinking something because you have to you know i look at it deeper than that you know what let's hit let's hit a couple of gun things here and we've been doing let's this do for it. a while um have you seen this thing with the smart gun that um this hacker has unlocked with magnets i can't even be surprised yeah so it says um this is in wired anyone anybody can fire this locked smart gun with 15 dollars worth of magnets so for gun control, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, I think we've been saying this for a long time. For gun control advocates, a smart gun that's, um, that's only its owner can fire has promised an elusive ideal. If your phone or PC can remain locked until you prove your identity, why not your lethal weapon? Now for the first time, a skilled hacker has taken a deep look into the security mechanisms of one leading example of those authenticated firearms. He's found that if smart guns are going to become a reality, they'll need to be smarter than this one. <laughs> so at, at yep. DEF CON, which I think is later this week, he plans on showing this, but he actually basically, you guys can read this article, it's on Wired. He, he, he hacked, he, there's multiple ways of doing it, but he was looking for the easiest one and it's just magnets. Yep. Uh, yeah. yeah. I can't even, I can't even begin to act surprised. Yeah, I mean, um, it's kind of like preaching to the choir with this one, right? Because we knew this was going to happen. Well, I just think like. Uh, I mean, because he also he also fun. found that you can make these things inoperable even by the owner. Yeah, and and like the idea of it is fantastic. Like, if I knew for a fact that my 
everyday carry gun could only be used by me only when I say it's okay, that sounds so great in principle. Um, in practice, it's a lot harder. Like maybe my wife needs to use it and I'm incapacitated. Like, yeah, that's number one. Like number two, like if it ever fails, if fa the failure rate has to be zero, like 0%, zero it can never fail. If it fails, it's always going to fail at the worst possible time. It's yeah, my, phone, my phone is pretty smart, but I can't get in there with my fingerprint all the time. I could tell you that. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Um, it, it, I'm not yeah. surprised. Let's yeah. move on to the next news article. This yeah, is a I mean, event. Yeah, I know. It's got, I figured I should do it because someone's going to say, oh, you didn't talk about that. So we did talk about it, but we already know that. So what about the news that the uh, U.S. appeals court blocks D.C.'s law restricting gun rights, which is basically D.C. has like a May issue law. So they block yep. that, you know, um, and basically they said it's a Second Amendment thing. Have you seen that? I did when you sent it over to me, so I appreciate it. Um, oh, okay. <laughs> do you do you even check into the gun news? <laughs> I check into a little bit of it. Yeah, okay. Um, I I'm probably not as as into it as I should be. Um, this is another one of those like good. Like, yeah, awesome. This is the way it should be. It's like, good news. Uh, yeah, like this is what they should have done years ago. You know, like it should not be this way. Um, I'm a like. So when I first got into the gun writing thing, like I was all about very naive of me, but like I was into like, you take a shooting test, you take a knowledge test, you do all these things. Right. Mm -hmm. I was like, this is a good thing. And then I went through. So at the time, Texas had a 10 hour training requirement and you had to take a shooting practical. Um, the guy who taught the class was a joke. Like it was absurd. Like he, it, I learned nothing from that class. Then I took the shooting practical and I think I still have my test target over here. I scored 249 out of 250. Like <laughs> you're awesome. You're a ninja <laughs> assassin. Like if I look at how I shot then, that was six years ago. And like how I shoot now, like I, the current version of me still sucks, but runs circles around that guy. Right. Mm -hmm. So like it wasn't even a good, like it wasn't even a good uh, test of your actual skills. Um, and like the the test, like the test you take is bullshit. So all it was was a revenue grab because it was, I think the total, I added it up when I did the thing, but I think between the licensing and the class and ammo and holsters and guns and shit, it is a 250 or $300 process and a weekend to go do this. Like it's stupid. Like, uh, yeah, it's it, a, it's it's a, a, I mean, people always say that they want us to, that they that for people to have access to these things, they should have more gun education. I think they should, but I think it's a kind of voluntary thing. You need to let people have access to these things, and then you know, grow and learn with it as they see fit. You know, and they'll make good decisions, right? We I think we were talking a little bit about that behind the scenes, where you said like uh, gun ownership is a is a good gateway to responsibility, something like that. You said, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, and I think that if you um, if you look at if you if you really want to watch somebody's brain short circuit, take somebody who says all those things about how like you got to have a test and a license and you need insurance, you need all those things, um, and then say why do you hate minorities? And they'll get really puffed up and they'll no, I don't. I love minorities. I want to do everything for them. You say okay, well like. What you're doing is disenfranchising minorities mm -hmm. who can't afford to take the time off from work, who can't, um, you know, they can't, uh, they can't afford the test, they can't afford this, they can't afford that. So you're, you're in practice, you know, preventing them from having access to the one tool that can level the playing field. And statistically speaking, they're the group who probably needs it most. So um, what, like, it doesn't affect me, like, I'm a middle class white guy, like, I have the money to pay for your test, for your stupid test. Like I have weekends off from my office job. Like, of course I can go do those things. Like, yeah, but we're, I think uh, we're, I agree with you, but I think we're also all getting nickel and dimed with all this crap and we should have a little bit more choice and people should want to do it. There's lots of things we have in our lives that are dangerous. I mean, to our children, et cetera, you know, sure. should you, should you take a course before you bring home those gel packs for, uh, 
washing the clothes? Because <laughs> that's killed. That's killed kids, right? I just think like that argument is one of the easiest ones to gut out there because there's no there's no factual, objective, peer reviewed data to show that those sorts of requirements do anything, right? And number two, they disproportionately uh, disenfranchise uh, poor minorities, like a hundred percent. Like that's that's who stands to lose the most from those policies, not people, the face of the NRA, like old middle-aged white guys, you know, like yeah. those people don't care. Like, just like the silencer thing about like paying tax stamps and waiting, like that's not a thing, but like it, it, it just doesn't affect them. So like, yeah, like the face of the NRA is the least impacted by those restrictions, but like, Poor black families, poor Mexican families, 100%. Like, that's going to hurt them. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, I think I agree with you in that one. All right, let's 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 hit a couple more things. People want to know what do you hunt specifically, what rifle do you use, uh, what round do you like best, that kind of thing. Okay, so here, I'll just go into the safe. Take a little tour. Uh-oh. Hold on one second. Okay, um, let's see. So this is uh, – my go-to hunting rifle, it is a bolt action Ruger M77 in uh, 243 Winchester. And uh, it's been cut back to 18 inches. It has the fancy SIG brake on it because it is actually threaded half 28 for the SIG silencer. Uh-oh, so, SIG silencer yeah. goes on that bo bad boy. It has a 5.56 silencer on a 243. Um, so that's my go-to hunting gun. Now, hold on. I'll be right back. Okay. Um, there's, well, you know, wait, there's more. Well, there's shoes for every occasion, Hank, and there's guns for every occasion too. Um, oh, absolutely! I believe in that. We'll screw a can on the end of that one, so it looks like how it looks. This is a longer one, but uh, I got invited to go on an elk hunt that I don't think I'm going to be able to go on. But I built a rifle for it. This is a Savage millimeter magnum with a proof research 28 inch barrel wow 20 inch inch barrel and, and what was it seven it's in seven mag seven mag with a wow. thunder beast ultra seven on the end <laughs> nice and uh let's see here i'll compare it to right next to me i have a uh let's see i have a 556 five, sbr with a 12 and a half inch barrel so let's see, those are, the butts are the same, so you can see how much longer it is. <laughs> yeah. Oh. Nice, so, nice. Uh, Hold on, let me lock it on you so we can see these guns. Okay, cool. So that's your SBR. Yes. So uh, it's a 12 and a half inch little Franken build. Okay, with, so you uh, built that up yourself. Do you prefer to buy your ARs or build them? I build them. Build them. Um, okay. Good, so, good answer. See, I'm, I'm about six feet tall, so this is a, about a five foot tall rifle okay. um, when it's all said and done. So those are uh, probably the two ones that I use the most. I got one more back here because people ask and I aim to please. Hank, let's dig deep through all the Nick's guns. There we go. We're back into my stuff again. All right. Yeah, we should. Uh, uh, I'm, not, I'm not saying that we would mind abusing, you know, or fondling some of Nick Leghorn's guns, talking about his guns, but no, let's Let's stick to the subject the old matter. Marlin 336. <laughs> Lever action. So that's a side loading. Yeah. You said it's a Marlin, right? It looks like it's a It is. Yep. The only modification I've made is a set of Wild West guns. Uh, that's a their peep rear and uh, fiber optic front. But uh, I have uh, loaded up some ammo for that, and I hope to take a deer with it this year. Let's pull out one of Nick's guns, though. That'll be fun. Yeah, let's definitely... Uh fondle one of Nick's guns, so I don't know if he's, he's going to probably wind up watching this at some point. I hope he does. <laughs> um, so this is the, uh, the oh. aforementioned 12 and a half inch. That's a sexy beast. Look at that. 12 and a half oh, inch Scar color. 17. Oh, yes, it is. That's With beautiful. Fancy m -lock trail on <laughs> Belonging uh, to Nick Leghorn, no less. I mean... Uh, right. Does it there. say this on there? It says Nicholas Leghorn. Oh, okay. So that's his star. That should be historic right there. You know, yeah. you get Nick Leghorn's gun and you do reviews. 
That's right. Um, you know, I would just I would just do videos where I just uh, tease Nick. Like, I wonder if Nick is missing this gun today. <laughs> you know. Uh, let's see what else. Ooh, I got another one. He dropped this off just the other day, actually. Because you know he's going to regret selling this gun, right? You know that, right? Of course. Uh, yeah. This is Nick's MCX, and, uh, and this is the one with the fancy brace on it. So that's just a pistol. And that is, I think this is Timney's little adjustable trigger on it. Oh, okay. The Timney trigger? Okay. Yeah. I wonder so, how, uh, how many rounds Nick Leghorn put through that. I have no idea. Yeah. But, uh, that is a Nick Leghorn gun, so yeah. now the people know. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. That's right, Nick. So that's, we looked at, we got to look at your guns. Just touched them all. Got our yeah. fingerprints all over them, really fondled them a we little bit. We came through and virtually abused them with our fingertips. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Um, yeah, so that's some, some Nick Leghorn stuff. Yeah. Fun. That's... All right, yeah. one more gun, one more gun here, and then we'll... we'll one more. I got, I, got no, I got no more to show you. I think that's... Got uh, no more? Yeah. No more? Okay. I think that's the, uh, we wanted to look at hunting guns, and I showed you hunting guns. Yeah, so. one more. Look, so, so one more time, I will just... Just so you guys can see it, so Babyface can see that it's in a video. Look at that beautifulness. Look at that awesome. Check that out. That's a really nice finish here on the Colt Python. Babyface needs to like engrave a little crying baby. Big a little crying big baby big headed baby in here. You don't even have a logo yet, Babyface. We gotta get a logo for Babyface. So there we go with the guns. You know what, man? Um, I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna wrap this up. So the thing I wanna do is give you a chance to, uh, you know, promote whatever you want to, written by Tyler Key. That's what we should do. And whatever else you're getting up to. I appreciate it. Um, thanks. Uh, well, thanks for the opportunity. I'm uh, at this point, you know, like uh, getting just off the ground. So. Uh, any exposure is good exposure, and I really appreciate you uh, giving me the time. And I hope one day I'm so huge and humongous that I can, you know, repay the favor two or threefold. Uh, that awesome. would be super, super cool. Um, Absolutely, I'm happy just to have you come on, man. And I hope that lots of people like seek out the website and read your read things from your <laughs> point of view. I think they'll enjoy it. And they've been they've well, been reading articles from you for six years plus, right? So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, I'm hoping that, uh, and and I'm looking at my traffic right now. By the way, the Hank Strange bump is real. Oh, nice, nice. So, <laughs> You're so, a good guy, man. I'm not. I'm, you know, I'm not making no, it up. I really I, think Tyler's a good guy. We get along. We have good chemistry. You know, oh, yeah. where, yeah, um, we've got would, a little bromance going on. Huh? I would cook a meal for you. That's, that's awesome. Awesome. I'll say that. If you're in Texas, you come to my house. I'll cook some food for you. Um, it's a date. So yeah, I'll, I'll, <laughs> I look forward to it. Um, so just, I, I started written by Tyler Key as a place for me to publish, um, you know, gear and gun reviews, which is a thing that I was doing and that I liked. Um, also guidance for reloading, cooking, fitness. Soon I'll have a baby. So how to swaddle a baby. Anything that I learn along the way, I want to write it down and put it there. And then, um, you know, stories about people that I think are great and uh, places that I've been that are great and, and things I've experienced that are great. So um, written by Tyler Key.com is kind of the home for that. Um, I post on Instagram at written by Tyler Key.com. I try to post daily and it's, you know, pictures of guns. It's uh, uh, the other day I posted a screenshot of a Swedish uh, metal band that I listened to while I worked out and I really enjoyed Okay, nice. <laughs> um, any, any anything anything that I think is related is uh, is going up there. So, uh, man, I really appreciate the opportunity to come on, and uh, I hope that people enjoy the things that I uh, that I write, and I hope it's helpful for them. So, um, anything I can do for you, man, you let me know, and I will try my best to make it happen. Absolutely, I'll do that. And what I hope is that you'll come back on, you know. Uh, when you've got something, things you want to talk about, or just periodically come on, hang out with us, you know. My my door is open and it sounds like yours is too. So we'll uh, we'll make it happen sooner rather than later. How about that? Absolutely, that sounds good to me. Okay, so before I end this here, I want to thank everyone that's been uh, listening, watching, uh, the folks that are making comments in the live chat, as well as everyone who supports us. We are on iTunes now. I think we're up to twenty episodes on iTunes. So I encourage everyone to go listen to that uh, and, and leave us positive reviews there so we can keep it going. I want to thank the, the folks that sponsor the, the uh, Hank Strange situation. That would be Rand CLP, um, 
Andrew's custom leather, Safety Harbor firearms, as well as Big Daddy Guns that provides all this uh, studio goodness that we're enjoying over here. And especially want to give a big thanks to everyone that supports us on Patreon. We're Patreon slash Hank Strange. Any last words, Tyler Key? Dude, thank you for everything you do, and thank you for everybody uh, who listened in. I really appreciate it, and uh, I look forward to, uh, to working with you some more, Hank. Yeah, same here, man. You know how I end my videos. Well, let's do it on this one. Throw up the two. I went. I was on your video. So yes, that was a while like back. Yeah. Okay, is there a new ending? Tell me the yeah, new let's ending. Yeah, throw, let's throw up the twos like this, man. Peace. Okay. <laughs> there you go.